right, well, welcome everyone for our uh, seminar this morning on Baptism and the Lord's Supper. I really appreciate you taking the time out on Saturday morning to, uh, to come together uh, like this. I hope you'll find it a, a fruitful and interesting time, uh, a good chance to get uh, questions answered uh, about uh, this uh, important uh, topic. And uh, I know some people will be uh, joining uh, from home as well, or maybe watching this recording later on as well. So thank you for, uh, for joining us uh, as, uh, as well. Now, just a bit of uh, context as we, as we begin. Uh, we've had lots of questions that people have asked about uh, baptism and uh, the Lord's Supper, uh, in particular about whether or, uh, the participation of children, whether children should get baptized or not, uh, whether children should participate in, uh, in the Lord's Supper uh, or not, uh, what we call pedo-baptism and pedo-communion. Uh, and... Our goal is to study the scriptures, to see what the scriptures has to say about baptism and the Lord's Supper in general, but we'll, we'll spend a bit more time uh, thinking about those uh, questions of how it relates to, uh, to children as, as well. Uh, so I, I do hope that uh, you'll be asking questions as we go through. The, roughly how it's going to work, I think you can see the, the program, hopefully we'll you can put the program on the screen. Uh, we're going to uh, roughly spend about one an hour and 15 minutes on, on each topic. Uh, we'll start with a song in a moment. We'll start with baptism for about an hour and 15. We'll break for morning tea to get some food, stretch our legs, etc. And then we'll have the second session uh, on the Lord's Supper. And uh, part of it will be uh, us teaching from the front here. Part of it will be we'll get you to look at some passages uh, together and discuss with people around you. Uh, and then you can ask your own questions uh, as, as well. And we'll, we'll try and answer those as, as best uh, as we can. Now, uh, even, even though we're going from roughly 9 to 12, it's, it's still going to feel fairly rushed because, uh, I mean, it's a thick handout. There's quite a lot of things we could, we could cover under these topics. So we're going to have to move through things still rather quickly, but uh, we will slow down and focus on the things that you have uh, questions uh, in particular. Uh, so what's our, what's our goals? You can just click through the slides a bit. So the goals are there. Firstly, uh, we want to be more biblically informed about these issues. Second. Uh, we want to learn to, sh to, uh, to uh, show charity and unity where we don't uh, agree entirely. Uh, we might have slightly different positions on things. Uh, and uh, thirdly, after the, uh, after the seminar, we hope to, have a, to develop some policies on this as a church. So this is to help the leaders uh, in thinking about that uh, as well. Now, just before we uh, dive in, I want us to recommend a couple of uh, uh, books uh, that you could think about. Uh, first one there, Baptism and the Lord's Supper. You'll see quite a number of quotations from that as we go through. It's a very thin book, but a good introduction uh, to the topic. Uh, and then on the, on the right, Children and the Lord's Supper. Uh, I brought some other books that I'll introduce a bit later on as well, which you're welcome to, uh, to borrow from me. Uh, okay, we're going to start uh, uh, by thinking about uh, the sacraments. When we talk about Baptism and the Lord's Supper, we're talking about what is uh, traditionally called the sacraments. Uh, and so let's think, uh, we're going to begin by thinking generally about what the sacraments are, and then we'll look at baptism and the Lord's uh, Supper uh, one by one. So firstly, what is uh, a sacrament? A sacrament is an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace. An outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual uh, grace. So in other words, there's, there's two parts to, to a, sac a sacrament. Uh, there's the, the, the visual uh, picture of it, and there's the thing that it, it represents. Now, um, marriage is not uh, considered to be one of the sacraments, but just by way of illustrating, uh, say uh, the, the symbol or the sign, the sacrament of marriage would be uh, your, your wedding ring, right? Uh, the wedding ring is meant to point you, to, it's meant to represent something. It's meant to point you to the promises that you, uh, you made on your, your wedding day to be faithful to your spouse for better and for worse and, and so on. So you can see the two parts, right? You have the sign and then you have the reality or what it, uh, what it represents. Yes. So a sacrament, an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace. So uh, this is what uh, that book, Baptism in the Lord's Supper, says. In giving these ordinances to the church, the Lord provided visible words that communicate the believer's union with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. That's baptism. And the outworking of that union, namely continuing fellowship with the Lord, uh, that's the Lord's Supper, both then become not just ordinances to be obeyed, but also means of grace for strengthening 
and enjoyment until Christ returns. Uh, so you can see how the sacraments are being uh, described there. They're being described as a visible uh, word. In other words, they're meant to be a, a picture of the gospel. When we talk about the gospel, we're talking about the death and resurrection of Jesus for our sins. He dies as our Savior. He is resurrected again as the Lord uh, of all. And the sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper, are meant to be uh, pictures of the gospel, uh, visible, visible words. Uh, normally you would speak the gospel. The, the gospel comes in words. But as you uh, have the baptism and the Lord's Supper, they are visually depicted uh, uh, in, in, in particular ways. Uh, so they also, uh, we also talk about the sacraments as a sign and a seal, right? A sign and a seal. Let me read the quotation there. The sacraments are not only signs that point our attention back to Jesus Christ as presented in the gospel and thus remind us of his grace offered to the world. Uh, so that's, you know, that's the wedding ring. It's a, it's a sign. It's pointing you back to the promises that you, you, you made when you, uh, when you got married. Uh, so they're not just signs. It says they are also seals, which assure us that God's grace and promise are given to us in particular. The word seal, when used in the context of the Reformation, referred to the wax imprint that marked a document as official and legal, legally binding. I think we still use that today. If you've got your uh, university degree, uh, then uh, you probably have the, uh, the wax, wax stamp the, or the university imprint uh, to, to show that it's a genuine degree. You didn't just uh, buy it uh, uh, online from Lazada or something uh, to pretend that you had a degree. Right, so the, the stamp, the seal, it shows that it's, it's genuine and it's real. In this context, baptism is the seal whereby God takes the general promise of the gospel and applies it to us in particular. In the ancient world, the same word also referred to marks on the body, brands or tattoos, which functioned as a mark of ownership, we are marked by Christ's death and resurrection as witnessed both by baptism and the Lord's Supper. Again, we still do this today. If you've ever been to a cattle farm or something like this and you, you brand the, uh, the animal to show that uh, who, who it belongs, uh, belongs to. Uh, and so what this means is uh, that the sacraments, uh, uh, they're not just about uh, remembering things that happened in the past, but they actually achieve something. They actually uh, do something. They, they, are, they are means of grace with, whereby God uh, encourages our faith, uh, strengthens our faith in the Lord Jesus and in his gospel. Again, just to use the example of a, of a, of a wedding. See, when I'm wearing my uh, wedding ring, it doesn't just remind me that, oh, yeah, I'm actually married, um, but it actually helps me to be faithful to the promises that I've made. So, oh yes, I did promise to be faithful for better, for worse, and so on. And so I, I, I need to be doing that. I need to be loving my wife sacrificially as I, as I promised. So it's not just something that uh, reminds you that you were married, but it actually achieves something. It actually does something. It, it strengthens you uh, in, those, in those promises uh, that were made. Uh, so God's sacraments or or covenant signs us and seals are visible words. In them we see with our eyes the promise of God. In the sacraments we see, smell, touch, and taste the word. Okay, so that's what a sacrament is. Now let's go to the next part, how many sacraments. And there's only two sacraments given to the church, and they are baptism uh, and the Lord's Supper. Uh, in fact, in Roman Catholicism they've got seven, so this is a reaction uh, against that. So baptism, the outward and visible sign is the water, and what it represents, as we'll see, is the washing by the Holy Spirit, a new birth, union with Christ. The Lord's Supper, the bread and the wine, is the outward visible sign, and they represent the body and blood of Christ. That is his death uh, on, on the cross. Uh, so what do they represent? Well, uh, baptism as, is more about initiation into the, into the Christian life. It's more a badge of membership uh, among God's people, if you like. Whereas the Lord's Supper is more, it's a fellowship meal. Like when you eat, with, eat together with someone, you are, you're, you're expressing a fellowship with them. You're, you're showing that you're in, you're in relationship with them. So baptism is more about entry or initiation, membership. And then the Lord's Supper is more about doing, uh, fellowship and, and, and building and nourishing and nurturing uh, that relationship uh, that, uh, that, we already, that is already established, right? 
Uh, and so we, we read here, we believe that baptism and the Lord's Supper are ordained by the Lord Jesus himself. The former is connected with entrance into the new covenant community, the latter with ongoing covenant renewal. Together, they are simultaneously God's pledge to us, divinely ordained means of grace and public vows of submission to the once crucified and now resurrected Christ and anticipations of his return and of the consummation uh, of, of all things. Okay, so that's a, that's a very brief uh, introduction. And uh, maybe just to close off this section before we turn to baptism itself, uh, we can read some of the, the Reformation teaching. Uh, the, the quote there on page four, it's, this is taken from the 39 Articles. So that's the Anglican Statement of Faith. Uh, we'll look at uh, the Presbyterian Statement of Faith, the Baptist Statement of Faith at the various points uh, later on today. But this is the, is the Anglican one. This is classic Protestant uh, evangelical uh, Reformed teaching on the sacraments. Right? Sacraments ordained of Christ be not only badges or tokens of Christian men's profession, that is signs, but rather they be certain sure witnesses and effectual signs of grace and God's good will to us. Uh, that is, they, they, they do something. They strengthen your faith. God uses them for good. By the which he doth work invisibly in us and does not only quicken, that means bring to life, but also strengthen and confirm our faith in him. There are two sacraments ordained of Christ and the Lord in the gospel, that is to say baptism and the supper of the Lord. Those five commonly called sacraments, this is talking about Roman Catholicism, that is to say confirmation, penance, uh, orders, that's ordination, uh, matrimony, marriage, and extreme unction, that's the last rites. Uh, they are not to be counted for sacraments of the gospel, being such as have grown partly of the corrupt following of the apostles, partly estates of life allowed in the scriptures, like marriage, but yet have not the like nature of sacraments with baptism and the Lord's Supper. For they have not any visible sign or ceremony ordained by God. The sacraments were not ordained of Christ to be gazed upon or to be carried about, but that we should duly use them. So in, in Roman Catholicism, uh, people would try to like you know, steal the bread and take it home and then you know, worship it at home and, and these kinds of, uh, of things. Uh, so we're not to be in, in superstitious in all these kinds of ways. Uh, and in such only as worthily, worthily receive the same, they have a wholesome effect or operation. They that receive them unworthily purchase to themselves damnation, as St. Paul said. So uh, you have to, in other words, for them to help you, you need to uh, use them in the right way. Now, if you use it in the wrong way, it's not going to help you. In fact, it's going to, to harm you. Uh, and then the next uh, one, uh, of the unworthiness of ministers, which hinders not the effect of the sacrament, says this, although in the visible church the, uh, the evil be ever mingled with the good, and sometimes the evil have chief authority in the ministration of the word and sacraments, yet for as much as they do not the same in their own name, but in Christ, and do minister by his commission and authority, we may use their ministry both in hearing the word of God and receiving the sacraments, neither is the effect of Christ's ordinance taken away by their wickedness, nor the grace of God's gifts diminished from such as by faith, and rightly do receive the sacraments ministered unto them, which be effectual because of Christ's institution and promise, although they be ministered by evil men. Okay, let me uh, uh, just paraphrase that. Uh, it's saying uh, the effectiveness of uh, baptism and the Lord's Supper is not tied up with who does it, right? So say, for example, uh, you got baptized by someone who turns out to have been having an affair uh, and then they give up the Christian faith and they become a Buddhist monk or something. Right? Uh, it doesn't mean that your baptism is uh, invalidated um, and therefore you have to go and get baptized again. It, the important thing is not who does it, but uh, they're, they're representing Christ in the words that they say. So as long as it's done in the right way, way, it doesn't matter who has, uh, who has done it. But it continues, nevertheless, it appertaineth to the discipline of the church that inquiry be made of evil ministers, and that they be, accu that they be accused by those who have knowledge of their offenses, and finally being found guilty by just judgment be the poll. So we're not saying that, you know, uh, who cares if the minister's bad. If, he's, if he commits evil, he should be disciplined, right? But it doesn't uh, affect the uh, sacraments. Okay, so that's the introduction. Any questions you want to ask there? All right, let's, let's go into baptism then. We're on page five. 
what is baptism, firstly? Uh, well, it's the sign and a seal, as we've been saying. Uh, the Westminster Confession of Faith, this is the, the Presbyterian Statement of Faith, it puts it like this. It is a sign and seal of the covenant of grace, of the believers in grafting into Christ, of regeneration, of remission of sins, and of his giving up unto God through Jesus Christ to walk in newness of life. So let's have a look at some of the scriptures teaching about this, and then we'll try and draw that together in terms of uh, theological reflection. So the Old Testament background for understanding uh, baptism uh, is, is actually the, uh, the Exodus uh, and uh, what happens as God saves his people and leads them uh, through uh, the waters of the, of the Red Sea uh, out uh, towards uh, the promised land. Uh, so look at what Paul says here in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 10. The verses should be on the screen. Uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter uh, 10. It says, I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And then it goes on to talk about other things. Right? And He's using uh, what we call here uh, typology, right? He's, he's showing how uh, things in the Old Testament are pointing forward to, uh, to Christ. You see that how he continues. He says, all ate the same spiritual food, all ate the same spiritual drink. They drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Now, when Moses struck the rock in the Old Testament, the water came out. Uh, they didn't think, uh, that none of them would have imagined that they were drinking water that came from from Christ. It was just water that came from the rock. But it was a type, it was a picture that was foreshadowing uh, a greater spiritual truth in the gospel related to Jesus. So it's saying that when Israel went through the Red Sea, it was like their baptism. Right? As they went through the waters, their old life in Egypt was over, their old life of slaves serving Pharaoh and so on. As they came out, they, they came uh, out into new life. Right, as, as God's uh, saved and redeemed uh, people. And, of course, Israel would look back uh, to, uh, to the, Red, you know, the Exodus and the Red Sea as the time that they became uh, God's people. So this is, uh, this is then picked up by John the Baptist uh, in the Gospels. Let's go to Luke chapter 3. And uh, we're told that, when, uh, that John went into all the region around the Jordan proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of of sins. Now, the context at this point is that uh, by the time of the first century, baptism was used as kind of an entry right uh, to become a, a, a Jewish convert, right? Uh, so it was especially for those who were wanting to, who were non-Jews, who wanted to become uh, Jews. Uh, of course, you would you could receive uh, circumcision as well, but this was one one way of symbolizing that you wanted to become a, a convert to, to Judaism. But what John is doing here is, of course, he's not just uh, baptizing uh, uh, non-Jews or Gentiles. He's, he, everyone needs to come uh, and be baptized. As a reminder that it, being a part of God's people, it's not just about your, your, your bloodline or your lineage, but you, you need to, to uh, receive it by repentance and faith. So it's a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of, of sins. Repentance. What's repentance? Repentance is a U-turn, right? You're, you, 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 you're going one way, you stop, you turn around, and you go back uh, the other way. Uh, and so in this context, it's, you, you confess that you're living a life of sin, and you're going to turn around and come back and live, live God's, God's way. And that is being uh, pictured or symbolized uh, in baptism, right? Uh, it's Baptism is kind of like uh, your death and resurrection, right? As you go under the water, you're saying, my old life is, is over. It's finished. I'm turning away from that old life of sin. As you come out of the water, it's like you're being reborn or uh, resurrected to a, to a new life uh, that is uh, different to the, to the old one. And we're told here it's a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And so as you repent uh, in this way, and it's symbolized by the, uh, the baptism, then it re results in the forgiveness uh, of, uh, of, of sins. So that's the, that, that's the outward sign. Uh, there's two types of baptism in the, in the Bible. This is the water baptism. John's baptism, with, uh, the baptism with water, is a picture of repentance 
for forgiveness. But what it's ultimately pointing forward to is the idea of, of spirit baptism or baptism uh, with, uh, with the Holy Spirit. As you come down in this passage, you see that uh, explained in verse 16. Uh, so they're, they're wondering whether John the Baptist is the Christ or not. John answered them all saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor, to gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Now, of course, the charismatic church loves to talk about baptism with the Holy Spirit, and, uh, and, 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 and they talk about baptism with fire. Uh, with with fire in that way. The baptism with fire here is it's not so much uh, relating to what happens at Pentecost, but he's saying you've got a choice. Either you can be baptized with the Holy Spirit and therefore be one of God's people, or you will be baptized with fire. And that's what's being talked about in verse 17, the, the, the chaff being burned with unquenchable fire. It's, it's, talking, it's a picture of, of, of hell, a graphic picture of hell. So you don't want to be baptized with, uh, by Jesus with fire in that sense, right? You want to be baptized with, uh, uh, with the Holy Spirit. And this is going back to the promise in the Old Testament from Ezekiel uh, chapter 36. I don't have this on the screen. You might want to turn back there uh, in, in your Bibles. Uh, Ezekiel 36 says this, I will take you from the nations. This is verse 24. Ezekiel 36 verse 24. I will take you from the nations and gather you from the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses. From all your idols I will cleanse you and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my my statutes and to, to be careful to obey my my rules so uh, so water baptism is it's it's just an outward picture it's a you know picture of washing renewal of new birth but it doesn't actually uh, change you in in, in any way uh, what it's but what it's pointing forward to is the baptism of the holy spirit what we actually need is our hearts changed and and that was the promise in the old testament israel was stubborn again and again and again they kept on rejecting god's ways uh, and they needed New hearts, they needed God's spirit to change them from within so that they could really live, uh, live his way. And, and that's, what, that's the, the baptism that Jesus is going to, to bring. He's the one who's going to pour out uh, his, his Holy, Holy Spirit. And so as this passage continues, we see that uh, uh, this, uh, this promise is fulfilled almost immediately in what happens with, uh, with Jesus in verse 21 at his own baptism. When the people were baptized, when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were opened, the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove, a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. So notice how Jesus receives both the sign and the reality. He receives the baptism with water, but as he's baptized with water, he also uh, experiences the baptism uh, of, of the Holy Spirit. And, of course, Jesus doesn't need to repent of his sins. He doesn't have any sins to repent of. But why, why does Jesus go through the water, uh, water baptism? Well, it's to identify himself uh, with the people on the one hand, as he's going to be their, their savior who's going to succeed where they've failed. But on the other hand, it, it marks him out as the promised savior king. Because in the book of Isaiah, both the, the king and the suffering servant, they have the Holy Spirit uh, resting, uh, resting upon them. Uh, now, this is ultimately going to be uh, uh, fulfilled uh, in uh, Pentecost with the pouring out uh, of the Holy Spirit by the risen Jesus. So as we come to the book of Acts, uh, we see this. While uh, staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, but John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And that's referring back to what we just saw in Luke. Uh, and then in the next, uh, the next chapter, uh, that's, that's what's going on at Pentecost. As the Spirit uh, comes down on, on the disciples and they're speaking in tongues and so on, we're meant to understand that they have received uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The resurrected Jesus is now enthroned in heaven and he's able to pour out uh, his Spirit promised in Ezekiel 
to change the heart of all who will repent uh, and turn, uh, turn to him. And so at the end of his uh, speech, uh, his uh, Pentecost sermon, having declared that Jesus is Lord and Christ, uh, they ask, what should they do in response? And Peter says to them in verse 38, repent and be baptized, you know, as a, as a picture or a symbol of that repentance. Uh, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, because repentance symbolized by baptism leads to forgiveness, and you will receive the gift of the the Holy Spirit. Right? So you can see that both the water baptism and the spirit baptism is still is, is present there. Right? Uh, you repent and you, you symbolize that by water baptism, but that repentance, that conversion to Christ, submission to Jesus as Lord, it means that you also receive the Holy Spirit to live in your heart. And he continues, the promise is for you, for your children, for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God call, uh, calls to himself. We'll come back to that in a moment when we talk about uh, pedo, uh, pedo baptism, So 1 Corinthians 12 is another, another place where we, uh, where we see this. Uh, it says that basically uh, baptism with the Spirit is the mark of all genuine believers. And just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, all were made to drink of one Spirit. That is, if you are a real Christian, you have been baptized with the Holy Spirit. There's not, none of this uh, uh, charismatic second blessing stuff that says that, uh, that there some people, who only, only, some Christians have only been baptized by water, and then there are the, the super spiritual Christians who've baptized with the Holy Spirit and they can speak in tongues and do all these things. No. All Christians are baptized with the Holy Spirit, they receive the Spirit at their, at their conversion. And the water baptism is meant to be an outward and visible picture of that, uh, what happens in the heart. Uh, so why do we still receive the sign? You might say, okay, if, if, it's, if the water baptism is just a, a picture that's pointing forward to the reality, then uh, surely it doesn't matter whether I get baptized. You know, so long as I, you know, as long as I, I have the reality there, I've, I've, I've repented, I've turned to Jesus, I've got his Holy Spirit in my heart, then surely it doesn't really matter anymore whether I receive um, the Spirit. But the fact that, that, uh, that, the, that you have the spiritual reality, it doesn't mean that you no longer need to receive uh, the sign. Uh, if you're still there in, uh, back in uh, Acts chapter 2, you see that, and also in the Great Commission, Matthew 28. Remember what Jesus says, uh, the risen Jesus he says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So Jesus commands us to be baptized. He continues, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, which surely includes that command that he's just given to, to, to baptize people. It's the same with Peter at, at Pentecost. Uh, they've already received the, the, the uh, baptism with the Spirit, but he says, repent and be baptized and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So in both, both Jesus and his apostles command uh, people to be baptized by water. Right? Uh, and it would be very odd in that sense to uh, say, oh, I've got the reality, therefore I, I, I don't need the symbol anymore. Just to go back to the marriage example, say, uh, yeah, so, you know, I've, I, I've, I've been married, uh, I've said my vows, but, uh, you know, I don't want to wear a wedding ring. Yeah. It would be kind of a strange statement to make, especially if you're a married person and you decide, oh, I'm just going to take off my, my wedding ring. I'm not going to wear it anymore. Uh, you're going to be communicating something that is quite contradictory or, 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 or quite odd, isn't it? And it would be strange that you'd, you'd want to do that. The, the whole purpose of, this, of the wedding ring is to be an outward mark that you're married. So by not by not wearing it, then you're in, in some way you're, you're, you're kind of renou you know, renouncing your, your marriage or saying you, know, you don't really want to be married or something, which is not something that you really want to say. It's not going to make your spouse very happy. So receiving baptism is part of the Christian life. It's part of obeying Jesus as our king. Uh, baptism itself doesn't save you, but it's part of, of, of following, following Jesus. Okay, let me, let me stop there. Would you like to ask any questions? Um, you, 
uh, in Luke and Acts, you shown us that uh, receiving the Holy Spirit is part of the baptism, right? So if I were to say, you get you get baptized, then you receive the Holy Spirit. But then um, my my question would be like in terms of regeneration, right? A believer first understanding the gospel and receiving faith, right? Is the Holy Spirit not involved in that? Do we not already have the Holy Spirit working in us through that already before that? Right. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, so there's a difference between uh, being indwelt by the Spirit and then the Spirit kind of, uh, you know, working in you. And in that sense, the Spirit doesn't need to be indwelling you in your heart in order to, to, to be working in you. Um, and of course, you can't become a Christian without the Spirit uh, changing, changing your heart. Um, that's the point that is made in uh, the beginning of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, if we turn there. Uh, he says, uh, you know that when you were pagans, this is verse 2, you know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand, no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Right? So the point is, you will never say Jesus is Lord, my Lord, you'll never become a, a, a Christian unless the Spirit has uh, regenerated your heart to enable, uh, enable that uh, to happen, right? Um, and but, uh, So as the, the Spirit gives you repentance and faith, right, then he comes to you know, indwell, indwell you, um, or what we would call the, the baptism with, with the Spirit. So yes, uh, in terms of regeneration, yes, the Spirit brings about regeneration. And then he comes to, 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 to live, in our, live in our hearts. So one passage of Scripture will emphasize one aspect of that. Another passage will emphasize another. We've got to integrate them together. Does that answer your question? Okay, so let's go on to the next section. What does baptism signify? I've been talking a little while here. So now I want to uh, pass it over to you to do a bit of, uh, to do a bit of work. Okay? So let's, uh, let's divide the room here into half. Right, we'll just have two groups. So this this side of the room here, uh, you can do number one. Right, it talks about a new birth, and you've got uh, you've got two passages there: Romans chapter six and Colossians chapter two. So I want you to read those passages and have a think about uh, what they tell you about the meaning of, of baptism. Uh, and then on this side of the room, uh, I want you to have a look at uh, the uh, three passages under forgiveness, washing away of sins. So that's one Peter, Acts, and and Titus, and say, what does that what does that tell you about the meaning uh, of, of of baptism? Uh, if you manage to finish your section, then you could you could do the, the third one um, as the passages in the third one as well. Okay, so let, let me give you a few minutes to uh, look at those passages together and uh, and see what you can discover about the meaning of of that. Okay, let's let's come back together, and uh, if you've got questions, you can ask those uh, in a moment. So, what what does uh, what does baptism signify? Uh, what does it signify or represent, picture? The first thing it, it pictures is, is the new birth, right? The new birth, uh, or what we might call uh, regeneration, right? Uh, to new life. Uh, and it does this by, it, it's a picture of, of dying and rising with Christ. Now, I don't have this passage here, but you might want to turn across to Mark chapter 10 to see how Jesus death is described as his baptism, right? So uh, let's have a look at Mark chapter 10 and, uh, and verse 38. The context here is that uh, uh, two of Jesus' uh, disciples, uh, uh, James and John, uh, they have asked Jesus to sit at his right hand and his left hand uh, in, his, in his glory. And uh, this is how Jesus replies to this uh, rather foolish request for greatness in the kingdom. He says, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And what's he, what's he talking about there? He's, he's talking about his death, right? Because on the cross, he's going to, he's going to drink the cup of, of God's wrath. Uh, he's going to be baptized, you know, immersed, if you like, into, into death, in the, into the judgment uh, of God on, on sin. They said to him, we are able. Uh, Jesus said, the cup that I drink, you will drink. The, the baptism 
with which I'm baptized, you will be baptized, but to sit at my right hand or my left is not mine to grant. It's for those who, for whom it has been uh, prepared. Uh, so, uh, you, you know, they, they are going to, uh, uh, in, in the end, uh, be baptized. They are going to uh, share in, in, in Jesus' death, but they can't be at the right hand and the left. I, it's interesting there. He, is that talking about uh, the two criminals on the cross next to Jesus as, as, his, uh, as he dies, or is that talking about in his uh, resurrected glory? But you can see how baptism is being used there to describe uh, Jesus' Jesus' death. And so our baptism uh, symbolizes our union with Jesus right, in his death. And you see that in that Romans 6 uh, passage that some of you uh, looked at just now. The, uh, the context here is he's saying, look, should we con- now that we're saved by grace and not by works, does that mean we can just live however we want? And this is Paul's answer. Do you not know that all of us who've been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. And he continues in verse 5, For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. And this is picking up the doctrine of union with Christ. That is, when you put your faith in Jesus, uh, the Spirit unites you unites you to Jesus so that you are one uh, with him. Again, a bit like marriage. When you get married, then two, the two people become one flesh, right? So that they're no longer two, but they're one. Same when you put your faith in, in, in Christ. It's like, a, it's like a marriage with Christ. The two become, become one. You are spiritually united with Jesus such that everything belongs to, to him, his, his sonship, his uh, eternal life, the, his righteousness, etc., is, is, is given to you, and all that is yours is given, you know, your, your sin and your worthiness of judgment, etc., is, is given to him. You are united with Jesus. Uh, and what that means is because we're united with Jesus, that when Jesus died, you died. When Jesus was raised, you were raised spiritually. Ephesians 2 talks about this. You were dead in sin, but now you have been made Alive in Christ and seated with him in the heavenly uh, places. Physically, of course, we're all just sitting, sitting here doing this, this seminar. But spiritually, because we're united with Jesus, we're, we're seated with him uh, in the heavenly places. And this is symbolized or pictured by baptism, right? So in baptism, as, as you go under the water, that is your burial, right? Your old life of sin is finished, it's dead. Over. As you come out of the water, it's your resurrection. Right? You are to live a new life for Jesus. And that's, that's what it's saying here, isn't it? Uh, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. And, and so therefore we are to then live that out. Verse 11 goes on to say, you, so you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Don't let sin reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Right? Present your members as instruments for righteousness. Your old life is over, so now you live a new life for Jesus. See a similar thing in Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 12 to 14. And he's talking about uh, union with Christ here. Let's pick up from verse 11. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by the putting off of the body of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ. I think that's talking about uh, the work of the Spirit, circumcising the heart, changing the heart. Verse 12, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. You were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. So when Jesus died, you died. When Jesus was raised, you were raised. No longer dead in sin, you're alive in Christ. And this is pictured by baptism. Okay, so, uh, and, and then this is to be lived out. So that's the new birth or regeneration. Uh, because of union uh, with 
with Christ. Uh, we, could, we, we could pick it up a slightly different way. In John's gospel, Jesus says, you can't enter the kingdom of God unless you are born again by the Spirit. The second one here is it symbolizes forgiveness or washing away of sin. And that's actually what the word uh, baptize means. Right? It means to wash or to immerse. Uh, it can be used in a non-technical sense, and it is used in a non-technical sense uh, like that in the Bible. So in Mark's Gospel, uh, chapter 7, uh, the Pharisees are upset that Jesus' disciples eat with uh, unwashed hands. And the issue is not that it was COVID time and they were worried about transfer of germs or something like that. They were worried about ceremonial uncleanness. Right? And uh, Mark says here that when they come from the marketplace, they, they do not eat unless they wash. There are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. And the word that is used for wash there is the word baptize. Right? So it can be used in that non-technical sense, just for, for, for washing something with, uh, with water. Of course, when you're washing your dishes, is it going to be fully immersed in the water? Well, maybe sometimes it is, maybe sometimes it's not. It's not really the point. It's just that it's talking about washing. Right? Okay, and so you see that picked up in the in the spiritual sense of the t uh, as applied to to baptism. So, firstly, one Peter three and verse uh, twenty one, baptism which corresponds to this now saves you not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, so, uh, so. The baptism is about washing, but it's not, it's not that the baptism itself is kind of removes the dirt from your body, but it's pointing to the cleansing of your, of your heart. That's the point he's making. So Acts 22, 16, I think this one is quite clear. Next one. Now, why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. So you can see our baptism there. It's, it's a picture of washing. Uh, Titus 3, 4 to 7, how, what, what kind of washing are we talking about here? Uh, Paul writes, when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope. Of eternal life, you see how um, how how it's described there. It's talking about the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit it changes our heart, it washes us clean from our sins. That's the that's the spirit baptism, right? Spirit baptism, washing, cleaning our heart, and water baptism is an outward, visible picture of that that washing. <coughs> now, just notice here. When it's talking about the spirit baptism here, how it's talked about the spirit being poured out, and uh, this is uh, this is going to be important when we talk about molds, whether we need to do full immersion or sprinkling is okay. Uh, you can see the the word for the word baptism it typically means to wash or immerse, uh, but when you get to spirit baptism, the language that is used is not of of that, but of um, pouring out. Yeah. Okay. So the first one. Uh, union with Christ, uh, the new birth, regeneration. The second one, forgiveness, washing away of sins. Uh, and because this is something that all true Christians are meant to do, thereby uh, it becomes a picture or, or a sign of membership among God's, God's people. Now, of course, the thing that makes you one of God's people is that you, re you have received the spirit baptism. Right? That's, you, you put your faith in Jesus, you've repented and turned to him as Lord, and you've received his spirit. That's what makes you a, a Christian. That's what makes you part of the invisible church. Uh, but water baptism, as the sign of that, is, is a, signifies membership in the, in, in the visible church. Because, I mean, we can't see into each other's hearts and see what's going on. We couldn't observe the fruit that is coming from our lives. But we can't actually uh, know uh, based on, uh, you know, we can't peer in like God can to see what's in our hearts. And so, uh, in, baptism becomes an outward picture um, that someone uh, belongs uh, to to the church. In terms of the, the spirit being the uh, a mark that we belong to the church, we could. There's a couple of passages you could look there. 
Uh, let me just add one additional, uh, one additional one from Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Uh, and this is what Paul writes there in verse 9. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if in fact the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. And so the spirit then becomes the mark of whether you belong to Jesus or you don't. Uh, and uh, baptism, which is a picture of that, becomes the outward, uh, the outward sign. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4 was one of the passages listed there. Well, let's just read the two of them. Let's go to the next slide. 1 Corinthians 12. In one spirit, we were all baptized. Right? Uh, we were all made to drink of one spirit. And then in same, similar thing in Ephesians. <laughs> There's one body, one spirit. You are called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. So, since we all go through this baptism together, it becomes a picture of membership in the church. <coughs> okay, any, any questions there? All right, we're, we're almost to the end of this section. So, uh, what does baptism actually do? Uh, we've seen what it signifies, but what does it actually do? Uh, so, let, let me read this quote. Baptism is God's means not to regenerate or justify us, but to confirm his promise to us, to put his mark on us and assure us of his love, all of which serve to increase and strengthen the faith of the believer and thus promote our growth in grace. That is, the baptism itself uh, doesn't save you, doesn't make you right with, with, with God, and we'll see that in a moment, but it does uh, confirm or so strengthen, yes, I am really one of God's people. I, I promised that I would, I would follow him, and I Made a, I made a, I did that before all of all of God's people, and he, and His promises were pictured to to me that He's washed away my sins and so on. So it, you can look back to your baptism, and it will assure you, yes, God really loves me. I'm really one of His people, uh, and and so on, and therefore help you to keep going in your Christian life. So a couple of wrong understandings, and then I'll pass over to to Alex to talk about the pedo baptism issue. So. Uh, these are very common ones. First one, baptism isn't about a profession of faith, right? Now, it's common practice in Christian circles that when someone is baptized, we ask them to share their testimony of how they, how they came to faith, right? The baptism itself is not a public, it's not about my profession of faith. Baptism is a picture of the gospel. Uh, the baptism is a picture of the death and resurrection of Jesus, the washing away of sins. It's not a picture of me. It's a picture of what Jesus has, has done for me. Right? So credo, credo Baptists would argue that baptism must accompany a profession of faith, but that's different to saying that the baptism itself represents a confession of faith. Secondly, baptism doesn't save. This is baptismal regeneration. That's the view held by Roman Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, High Anglicans, Ang or Anglo-Catholics, uh, some Lutherans, and other, other groups, and so on. Uh, they say that the, the, the water baptism is the instrumental cause of regeneration. Uh, that is, you need to be baptized to be a real, to be a real Christian. Um, but that's, that, that, that's not correct, right? That, that's, a, that's a wrong view. So let's go back to the, to the idea of uh, the marriage again. So say, uh, say today that uh, one of you uh, decided that uh, you're not married yet, but you say, oh, from now on, I'm just going to start wearing a, a wedding ring on my finger, yeah, on my ring finger. I mean, you can put a, a wedding ring on your, your finger. It doesn't mean that you are married, right? I mean, you could deceive yourself or try and deceive other people that you are, but, but, but you're not really, right? There's, there's no reality, and it's the reality that matters, not, not the sign, right? Uh, and in a similar way, you could go and uh, stand in a car park, right, in a car parking space. Standing in a car park doesn't mean that you are a car. You see. I mean, uh, that, that, that's, that's ridiculous. I mean, if you were a car, then you, the car would be parked in the car park. But just being in a car park doesn't make you a car. I mean, it's, it's, it's like that with, with baptism. So baptism is something that you will do if you're a real Christian. It's part of your obedience to Jesus. But it doesn't make you a Christian, right? Um, uh, yeah, what makes you a Christian is confessing Jesus as, as, as Luke's 10 passage here, uh, two slides down. Uh, 
uh, what makes you a Christian? If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved, right? So you must have a real faith in Jesus as Savior and Lord. Third, baptism doesn't wash away previous sins, right? This is the view of Roman Catholicism. When you're baptized, it washes away your you know, original sin before you became a Christian, and then you need to take the Mass and all the other confessions and various things in order to keep wash away your sins, and then you need last rites to, uh, you know, to wash away whatever was left that you didn't confess before you died. That's Roman Catholicism. That's not, that's not biblical, biblical teaching. The death of Jesus washes away all our sins, past, present, and future. It's not baptism that does that. Baptism is a picture of, of that, but it doesn't do it itself. Okay, uh, any questions on that stuff before I pass over to Alex? Maybe, is there any guideline or any prohibitions first? And then the second thing is whether, uh, maybe for some who wants to be encouraged, like they, they want to do it again as an encouragement of the faith, would that be also be um, allowed? Or what does the Bible say about that? Okay, uh, in general, rebaptism is bad, right? Um, and most statements of faith, and we'll read some of them in a moment, will will. will Actually, explicitly say that. Um, why is it wrong to be rebaptized? The reason it's wrong to be rebaptized is because it's a picture of the gospel, and you are destroying the, the the gospel image. I mean, Jesus' death and res Jesus' death for our sins on the cross, his resurrection, is sufficient. It's perfect uh, to to wash away all of our sins. So uh, it's a it's a once for all perfect thing, right? And that's what's being symbolized or pictured in baptism. So by Repeating the baptism, then it's, 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 uh, it's, it almost is undermining the once-for-all nature of, of, of Jesus' death. So if, if, it's a, if, it's a valid, if it was a valid baptism, um, then it, it, it shouldn't be repeated. What's a valid baptism? Uh, well, it's a baptism basically into the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in, into, the, into the Trinity. Uh, it doesn't matter necessarily what... To, denomination it was from, whether you were a child or an adult, whether it was done by immersion or not. Now, some Christians will have different views on that. We'll see that in a moment. So the Credo Baptist will say it must be by immersion. It must, and if it wasn't that, then it wasn't a baptism and you have to redo it. Right? But most other Christians would disagree with that and say, no, it's still a valid, it's a valid baptism. I have to accept it. But yes, um, yeah, valid baptisms don't need to be repeated. It shouldn't be repeated. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Pastor Tim. Um, I just had a question about the the separation between the pictorial or the symbolic aspect of baptism and the effects of it. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, I'm just looking at scripture, right? So like First Peter three twenty one, which you cited, it says baptism um, now saves you. Um, so I'm just wondering kind of where, either in this passage or in other parts of Scripture, there's the, the distinction, right? Like what you said, it's just a symbol, it's just a sign. Yeah, like how can we get that from Scripture? Thank you. Yeah, well, you, you can actually make a, quite, a very close connection between the sign and the reality. So it's possible to talk about um, the reality in terms of the sign. I was, gonna, I was kind of saving this for the Lord's Supper section, but we can do it here if you like. Um, so if you look on my phone here, on the, uh, th there's, a, there's a picture of my, of, of my daughter. I don't know if you can see that. Right? Uh, a very young, a young picture of her. Uh, she used to love Frozen, and there's a, a coffee there where they, they've drawn a, a Frozen picture on the top of the coffee. Now, I can point to this picture here, and I can say, this is Carissa. This is my daughter. Right? Uh, now, this is not literally <laughs> Carissa. I mean, she's not, she's not that thin. She can't fit into a mobile phone or whatever. We can understand that as a, as a photograph, this is a sign that is pointing forward to the, to, to the reality that is that there's a person who, who, is, who is Carissa who kind of looks like this or is, is used to. Right? Um, but I don't, I don't always have to say this is a picture of Carissa. I can just say, this is Chris. I can, I can talk about the sign as if it was the reality, right? 
Um, and so that's what's going on. Say, for example, in that verse you quoted from 1 Peter, where it says, baptism saves you. I mean, he, he, he goes on to clarify in the rest of, of the verse. It's not the waters itself that is washing away your sins or, or whatever. Uh, it's, it's symbolizing this uh, the appeal of faith to, uh, to trust in Jesus. Um, but because of what the, the sign is, is picturing, you can talk about the reality in terms of the sign. And so you could say baptism saves you in the same way I can say uh, this is Carissa. But you're not meant to understand that the act of baptism is literally saving you. It's the, it's the reality to which baptism is pointing that, that saves you. I hope that, hope that makes sense. Thanks. If you, if you point to your phone and say, oh, this is Carissa, and if you any other information, you know, saying that, oh, Carissa is an actual human being, and if all we have, you know, recorded in whatever, like, yeah, in, in history is just that one statement that says this is Carissa, then, yeah, what basis do we have for thinking that this isn't actually your daughter and that this is just a symbol? So, uh, other parts but of that's the thing, or... is that, we, that we do have the context, isn't it? So, I mean, if we're going to talk about the Lord's Supper, for example, then you know, Jesus says, this is my body, this is my blood. And Luther will say, oh, he, you know, he literally means this is his body. But we understand that he's talking in symbolic, symbolic language there, saying this bread symbolizes my body. This, 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 uh, uh, this cup symbolizes or pictures it. And... And what's the context? The context is the rest of the, of the New Testament that's, that's explaining to you that it's not, even in that verse itself, that it's not, uh, it's not baptism itself that's washing away um, your, 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 your sins. Yeah, thanks, Pastor Tim. So I'm just looking at that verse, right? It says, baptism which corresponds to Noah's Ark now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience. I think what um, what Peter is saying here is not so much that the water doesn't save, but it's like you know, he's saying, well, baptism doesn't save you as a physical cleansing, but it's not as though yeah you're like disinfecting yourself with some you know anti-COVID spray, but it's a spiritual cleansing, right? It's an appeal to God for a good conscience, but it's still pointing to the act of baptism. So the physical act of baptism is a spiritual appeal to God for a good conscience. I think that's what he's saying here. Is that is there a different but way you it, understand it? But it? it's not the act of baptism itself that saves you. I mean, you, you, right. if you want another example, an example of that, right? You look at the thief on the cross, right? Uh, Jesus is crucified with the two criminals. One of them says to him, uh, "Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom." Jesus says, "Today you'll be with me in paradise." They don't get out the water and take him down from the cross and you know and and, and baptize him so that he can be. No, there's no opportunity for him to be baptized. There's no opportunity for him to attend the church. Or, uh, it, I mean, if he wasn't being crucified, then he 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 should and he could and should have done all of those things, but he couldn't. Um, but Jesus says, "Today you'll be with me in paradise," even though he wasn't baptized. Right. So it can't be the act of baptism itself that is saving you. It's pointing forward. It's what it's pointing to. Yeah. yeah I mean, glory to God that. He is not bounded by even his own rules, right? He can choose to save whomever he wants, however he wants. Um, but I think, as you pointed out earlier, right, Jesus set baptism as the, the normal, the regular process, you know, for going through things. Um, so, yeah, as you say and as I agree with, if we can, we should be baptized because that's what the Lord commanded. And, you know, if we're on our deathbed, hey, praise God. Like, his mercy is boundless. His power is infinite. He can save us. Right. Um, so, sure, thief on the cross is an exception, but I don't think, oh, I'll say it's an exception that proves the rule instead of disproves it. But I'm sorry, I think this is, we can talk more later. Yeah. It's Thank okay. You. I'm still going to say that the Bible doesn't teach baptismal regeneration. Yeah. Uh, but maybe I think uh, uh, that's more a Lutheran view, maybe that you're putting forward. I'm not sure. Uh, let me pass to, to Ali. Uh, so let's uh, look at the next section. Are we uh, looking at infant baptism now? Uh, first thing to say uh, is that uh, Bible-believing Christians, uh, they all come to different conclusions uh, about infant baptism. So we've seen a lot of uh, similarities between... Uh, uh, we've seen a lot about baptism, uh, and some people think that baptism is only for adults, 
and other thing it includes infants, and this is where we uh, try and look at um, what the different views are. So let's define the terms first. Uh, there are two terms. Uh, first is uh, credo baptist, uh, and credo baptists believe uh, that only believers uh, should be baptized. And as you see, most uh, churches with the word uh, Baptist church, this is what they would believe. This is uh, one of the things that they would uh, hold on to. And one of the things that, that was alluded to as well was the mode. Uh, so in the quote here, uh, the mode that they baptize is only by immersion or only by dipping a person uh, into water. Okay, so that's what a, a Baptist uh, a Christian uh, would uh, believe or would hold on to. Uh, the second one is pedo-baptist. Uh, pedo refers to infant or child. Uh, and and pedo-baptists believe that both believers and their children, uh, as young as infants, should be baptized. Uh, for their mode, uh, they believe that, that baptism is best done by a fusion or by pouring or sprinkling of water. Uh, and we saw a little bit of a picture just now in terms of how uh, there's a pouring of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and say so they use that method. Uh, but uh, immersion is still valid, uh, but not required mode of uh, baptism. Uh, so these are the two, uh, the, the two positions. Uh, in fact, some people say, uh, the, the credo Baptist say, no, we shouldn't baptize infants. Uh, Pedro Baptist says, uh, yes, we can baptize them. Uh, and then the, the, the modes are, uh, uh, one, is on, one is limited to only immersion, the other one is uh, open to uh, uh, effusion or sprinkling or pouring. Uh, just one quote at the bottom if we have it. What's the next? Yeah, so just to read that quote again, emphasize that both groups seek to ground their baptismal practice in the teaching of scripture, so they're going back to God's word, uh, but both seem to come to different conclusions as to what the Bible teaches about the proper recipients of baptism. Uh, so it's a way of just thinking through, okay, uh, I think uh, uh, Christians can potentially disagree, disagree on this. And I think the call that we will make at the end is also uh, charity as well when we do disagree. Uh, how do we agree to disagree well? Uh, some reasons or arguments uh, for pedo baptism why, why is it valid uh, for, 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 for Christians to baptize their children? Uh, so, uh, first, a dot point there is that there is a precedent or what's happened before in the Old Testament uh, baptism. Uh, so, in the 1 Corinthians uh, 10 passage that we read just now, uh, 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 God rescued the people from Egypt, uh, out, brought people out of Egypt into uh, the, the Promised Land. And as they did that, as they crossed the Red Sea, uh, both parents uh, and children passed through that. And they were, uh, in a way, the typology is. Uh, is that they were baptized into Moses. Okay? Uh, so there's an Old, there's an old Testament uh, precedent there, a picture there. Uh, also, uh, in the next point, uh, there is a precedent in signage. Uh, signage in, the, uh, in that the Old Testament sign of being part of God's people, which is circumcision, uh, was given to babies eight days old. You see that in Genesis 18. And, uh, and then circumcision is fulfilled by the Spirit uh, in Romans 2. Uh, particularly Romans 2, uh, 28 and 29, if you want to mark that down. Uh, so uh, it is uh, fulfilled, but it's still analogous, as in there's still similarities uh, between the two. Uh, then uh, also first-generation Christians in the early church uh, would have expected that there is no change between uh, uh, the practice of uh, circumcision uh, with uh, the baptism of children. Uh, so they would have thought, because nothing is really stated there, uh, in, in, in scripture. Uh, also, uh, there is a command to repent and believe. Uh, the command to repent and believe seems to be offered to uh, the whole family. Uh, so in Acts chapter 2, uh, we read just now, uh, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children uh, and for all who are far off. Uh, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to Himself. So you see that the listeners in Acts two, uh, baptism is for they are to be they are to repent and be baptized, uh, and the promise of them receiving the Holy Spirit is not just for people for the listeners there, but also for their children. So those who 
who are actually very near to them, uh, but also those who are far off, those who are far away. Uh, all who calls uh, on the name of our Lord, uh, uh, on the Lord who, whom God calls to Himself. So there is a sense that children. There is a little indicator that indi- indicator that a children uh, is involved. Uh, also, given this, uh, uh, it would have been straight. It would not have been strange to assume that the whole family is uh, part of it. Uh, so, in, uh, in in the next point, house, households are baptized. Uh, whole households, complete households, are baptized in the New Testament. Uh, so, in Acts chapter sixteen, verse uh, uh, fourteen and fifteen, this will be uh, the houses of, of Lydia. It assumes that anyone who is there. Uh, whether it's uh, adult or children, were baptized. There's no distinction mentioned. It says, oh, only adults were baptized, but the children were not. It's not stated there. Uh, So uh, same thing uh, in the next point. Some connection in the household must still be there, not just individualism. Uh, That's in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 7, uh, verse 14b. Uh, It says that, uh, so for, for the first part, for the unbelieving husband is made holy because of, the, of his wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean. Uh, but as it is, uh, they are holy. And so there's some sense that uh, there's a, they have a special status uh, because one parent is a believer. Uh, and they, the special status here is referred to uh, being holy and not unclean. There's some inclusion because their parents or their parent uh, are believers. Uh, just a statement, uh, there, uh, summary, a summary there. I don't know whether you have it. God made, pro- in your outlines, God made promises to believers and their children in both the Old and New Testament. Uh, attach signs to those promises in both Old and New Testament. Explicitly require the sign of initiation into his family, uh, circumcision, to be applied to believers and their children uh, in the Old Testament. Uh, and implicitly uh, appointed the New covenant sign of initiation, baptism, to be given to believers and their children in the New Testament. That's a way of saying that, look, in the Old Testament, uh, there was this initiation uh, given to uh, infants at the start. Uh, That's very clear in the Old Testament. And in the New Testament, what is then implied, uh, this new covenant, what's implied, what uh, uh, seems to carry forward, is that uh, this can be given to believers and their children as well, uh, the sign of baptism. Uh, one more summary in your, in your outlines there. Uh, to deny baptism to children is to deny them membership in the, outward, uh, in the outward people of God. But parents always make decisions uh, for young children. It is the, responsib- it's the responsibility of children. As in, is Sorry? Responsibility of parents. Okay, so just, just edit that. I, I was under the impression that it meant that uh, this is uh, uh, parents' responsibility for their children that they again make, make, make the decision. So you know, correct that. Uh, they will need to eventually take responsibility for themselves, uh, but it doesn't mean that the parents should not make decisions for their child. Uh, that's why we encourage our children to pray, read the Bible, sing, go to Sunday school, because uh, we are treating them as believers. We assume they are believers until they are proven otherwise. In other words, we assume that they are in until they are really out. We assume that they are in until they are really out. And then you get some of that indication uh, from, say for example, we looked at the uh, the, the, the believing spouse just now, uh, where children are holy, uh, if they are not, they are unclean. Uh, but also, uh, even in Ephesians 6, it's not, in your, it's not written in your notes, but uh, Ephesians 6 verse 1, children are to obey their parents uh, in the Lord, uh, for this is right. So they're always already assuming that children are in the Lord and they are to obey the parents in the Lord. We assume them uh, that they are, uh, obe- they are to be obedient, uh, just as Christians are obedient to the Lord. So there's some sense there. I think if you're familiar with what Jesus says about children, um, he would say, let the little children come to me. Uh, do not hinder them. Uh, for to such, as in to those who are like children, who have 
nothing to give, nothing to offer God. But those who are like children, uh, to them belongs the kingdom of God. And I think that applies to children itself as well. They don't have anything to offer God. Uh, and uh, yet, uh, to them and to those like them, uh, to them belongs the kingdom of God. Those who are humble and have nothing, nothing to offer. Uh, those are arguments for uh, 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 pedo-baptism, as in baptism for children. I'll just work through the arguments for credo-baptism and then we can stop briefly for questions. Uh, so credo-baptism, uh, why only baptize adults and not children? Why only ba baptize those who actually say that they believe uh, 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 in Jesus? Uh, so there, uh, first point that baptism may only be administered to those uh, with personal profession of faith. Uh, and so, I have a few references there, uh, but the, the quote there uh, is saying, they hold that passages such as Jeremiah 31 teach that the church, uh, under the terms of the new covenant, is, ga is the gathered assembly of believing disciples. And that in this respect, they differ from believers under the old covenant, uh, which clearly included children. In other words, they're saying, look, uh, the uh, old covenant works one way. There is a change uh, in the new covenant uh, based on passages such as uh, Jeremiah 31. So although circumcision was uh, likewise a sign and a seal of faith administered to children, it is argued that things have changed under the new covenant. Uh, so that, that, that sign is no longer than, uh, that sign and seal is no longer than given to children anymore, but only to those who actually believe. Uh, and therefore, uh, next uh, uh, point B is that uh, parents should give their children uh, freedom to decide. Uh, worth adding that a lot of the examples of baptism that you see as well, perhaps this informs uh, 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 the view of uh, credo baptism is that uh, in the book of Acts, you always see uh, those who actually profess faith uh, then go on to get uh, baptized. Uh, uh, that's yeah, perhaps also driving uh, the arguments for credo baptism, as in those who actually profess uh, faith in Jesus. I'll stop briefly there uh, to see if there are questions or not. Uh, it's just a very simple question: the uh, for credo baptism, why is there no reference to the Old Testament? Because I can immediately think of uh, Exodus, Deuteronomy, where they say, um, uh, "Fathers." Um, I, I'm paraphrasing right now. Yeah, right, yeah. Right. Fathers, make sure you teach your children, have yeah. it on their hearts so they never yeah. forget. Yeah. That sort of thing. Wouldn't that be a good argument for credo, for, oh, sorry, for pedo baptism as well? Not credo, sorry, pedo baptism. That baptism will be an outward teaching of the children's faith, of the responsibility of the parents towards the children having faith and all that sort of thing. So you're wondering whether that can be included as one of the yes, arguments yes, for yes. pedo baptism. Yes, yes. Uh, it's possible. It's possible. Um, but yeah, I think these ones seems to be the, the, the more stronger ones. Uh, yeah. I can think of another one for another argument for pedo baptism. Uh, but also I think there's a distinction between old and old and new test uh, old and new testament uh, and old covenant, new covenant. Um, if you look at uh, if you mark down Romans chapter 4, Romans 4, 11 and 12, uh, it's still talking about the sign of uh, circumcision, but it seems that it's, can I, it's, a, it's, a, sign, uh, it's a sign of uh, or a sign of seal uh, of righteousness, uh, which can be given to children, but eventually uh, the children needs to walk uh, in the footstep of faith uh, of Abraham. Um, so that's in Romans uh, 4, 11, and 12. So, yeah, but to answer your question, yeah, uh, Jonathan, that can be, can be used, but I think there are stronger arguments uh, for these here. So, in pedo baptism, then, would you say that the initial one would be a valid baptism, or... How would this um, mechanism work then in a sense where, I guess in, I'm kind of like referencing like in Catholicism where they do allow infant baptism, then they have this whole like um, confirmation kind of thing. Yeah, so uh, 
yeah, the, their, their, in, their baptism as infants would still be valid because again, I think the, 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 they're baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, and they are uh, also, uh, it's the process that's important, uh, not necessarily uh, the age. Uh, yes, I think there are, there are churches outside of the, the Roman Catholic Church that also uh, practice the, the, uh, sorry, the confirmation process in that they then actually say, yes, I do believe uh, that what, uh, I do believe in uh, the Lord Jesus Christ and in salvation for me uh, and uh, want to uh, make that public, uh, but it doesn't, it doesn't minimize uh, the, the, the importance of what initially happened. So another way to think about um, uh, some people emphasize uh, that you must you must actually profess faith, and some people emphasize that, oh the background for that is uh, human responsibility, uh, but for those to, where the sign of uh, where the sign of baptism is given to children, it is a sign of God's initi uh, God's initiation, uh, God's sovereignty, uh, and putting the child into uh, a Christian family, uh, and that uh, grace is extended to them. Uh, un undeservedly as well. So that's another back, uh, another background for uh, how people look at the two. Like one is emphasizing on God's sovereignty, another one is emphasizing on human uh, responsibility. Uh, both are uh, both are parallel uh, in in the teaching of the Bible, compatible. Uh, but yeah, some people emphasize one with the other in the area of baptism. Right. Um, I'll just run, I'll just mention that briefly, we talked about it before, modes of baptism, uh, immersion or effusion, uh, effusion meaning either pouring or sprinkling. And I think both have uh, uh, indicators from, uh, from the Bible. Uh, immersion is obviously the, the, the uh, uh, immersion into water and then uh, raising up uh, from the water, coming out of the water, uh, signifies death and resurrection. Uh, uh, and effusion, uh, as in pouring or sprinkling, uh, those uh, that mode, uh, they seem to capture the pouring of the Holy Spirit. Uh, uh, yeah, depicted there in Acts chapter two. Uh, just uh, even more briefly, but uh, looking at the thirty-nine articles, the Westminster Confession of Faith and the Baptist uh, Confession of the of Faith. Uh, each one of them here uh, refers a little. Each one of them, I think, are very similar. Uh, so if you take the first one, 39 articles, uh, baptism is not only a sign of profession a mark of, mark, and mark of difference, whereby Christian men are discerned from others that are not Christian. It is also a sign uh, of regeneration or new birth, whereby as by instrument, they receive baptism rightly are grafted into church. Uh, the promises of forgiveness of sins and the adoption of sons of God by the Holy Ghost are visibly signed and sealed. Faith is confirmed, and grace increased by virtue of prayer unto God. The baptism of young children is in any, in any wise to be uh, retained in the church as most agreeable with the institution of Christ. So 13 articles coming from uh, the, the Church of England, the Anglican Church, uh, endorses the baptism of young children. Uh, but you see that it represents all other things as well. Uh, Westminster Confession of Faith, with most, uh, most uh, Presbyterian churches also hold on to, but many Reformed churches hold on to. Uh, lots more details there, uh, but they uh, sort of refer to the, to the same thing. Uh, let's see whether there is one, there is one note worth. So right at the bottom of uh, uh, the Westminster Confession of Faith, uh, that's note number seven. So it says that the sacrament of baptism uh, is but once to be administered unto any person. Uh, so that 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 prohibits a second baptism or a second half baptism, uh, which Tim was saying how it would uh, distort or would uh, water down uh, what God has done initially, uh, that uh, means of grace uh, to, to begin with, watering down the gospel. Uh, Baptist confession of uh, Baptist confession of faith. Uh, uh, again, all the points are similar, and I think that the difference is that uh, if you look at uh, point two. Uh, point two is that those who do actually profess repentance towards God, uh, faith in and obedience to our Lord Jesus Christ, are the only proper subjects of this ordinance. That means only those who 
uh, profess repentance, uh, profess faith, only they can be baptized. And others uh, cannot be. So they don't mention infants, but they quite, quite clearly say only, only professing Christians can be baptized. Uh, again, uh, even the way they are, the way they are baptized uh, is uh, in point five there. Immersion or dipping of the water in uh, what uh, dipping of the person in water is necessary. Uh, that means no other means. Okay. There's one last section, uh, which is on our policy, our policy on baptism. So this is something that the elders and deacons agreed to last year. Uh, and here are the here are the points that we've tried to draw from from scripture. Uh, uh, point one, ideally. Uh, Cross and Crown encourages parents who are both believers uh, to have their children younger than 18 years old, including infants, uh, baptized. Second, if a, young, young, a child younger than 18 years old is a believer and has consent from both a believing and an unbelieving parent, Cross and Crown will baptize that said child. That means if, one is, uh, if, if, if uh, both parents, but one is unbelieving, if they both say, okay, uh, then we will baptize the child. Uh, C. Uh, if a young, uh, young uh, if a child younger than eighteen years old is a believer, has consent, has written consent from both unbelieving parents, uh, C and C will baptize the said child. That means they themselves profess faith. Uh, so if, if they have their parents' consent, uh, we will happily baptize them as well. Uh, again, uh, in the opposite of that, D. Uh, if a child younger than 18 years old is a believer but does not have written consent from both parents to be baptized, a uh, cross and crown will refrain from baptizing the said child. Uh, it's a way of, I think, uh, thinking about honoring, uh, uh, for them to honor their parents uh, in obedience to Christ, uh, but then they can make the decision a bit later when they're older. Uh, e, if unbelieving parents wish to have their children, uh, infant baptized, uh, so this is unbelieving parents. Yeah, both parents are unbelieving. Uh, then uh, Cross and Crown will refrain from baptizing the said child. Uh, nevertheless, Cross and Crown will still encourage the unbelieving parents to consider the gospel of Jesus Christ towards repentance and faith. Now, this could be a case of potentially grandparents wanting the child to be baptized. Uh, in Western countries, uh, baptism of children uh, is uh, can be more common than in here 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 than here in Malaysia, uh, and uh, they just do it because oh, it's what uh, it's what I've always done even though they're not Christians. So it is to guard against that. Uh, F, uh, Cross and Crown views baptism, including infant baptism, administered in any other denominations as valid. That means if uh, wherever they were, where, whatever church they were baptized from, uh, they will be valid, uh, even for infant baptism. And we will not re-baptize believers. We will refrain from re-baptizing believers. Uh, nevertheless, uh, we will encourage such believers to publicly confirm, publicly confirm their faith in the congregation uh, if they have not done so before in their uh, previous church. Uh, lastly, uh, the normal mode of baptism is by immersion. Uh, the mode of sprinkling is applied primarily to infants and adults with uh, significant mobility limitations. Uh, so you'll see that we are try still trying to include uh, both uh, modes of uh, not, not disqualifying any one of the modes of uh, baptism. Uh, I'll stop there. Uh, I know we brushed through that last section uh, really quickly, but uh, any, any more questions before we take a break? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, first one is on the idea of uh, immersion. Uh, is that uh, supported by the fact that baptism uh, going under the waters uh, symbolizes dying uh, to sin. And secondly, uh, why, uh, as opposed to most pedo baptists, by the definition of what was given earlier, uh, does cross and crown have immersion as the normal mode? Yeah, I think the, the first question is yes, I think we do try and uh, the, the practice of immersion captures what happens spiritually. The, the language of the New Testament is that you're buried and you're uh, uh, raised to life, uh, and uh, I think the immersion aspect uh, has that sense. Uh, I think which is why then we use it as a normal mode. Again, uh, um, I think some churches do like 50-50 or whatever it is. Uh, some churches do more one of the other. Uh, 
it's worth saying. I think it's worth saying that both seems to be valid. Uh, it's perhaps at, at the elders and deacons committee level we think that uh, uh, the normal mode uh, is uh, one that is old, that is valid as well. Prefer that uh, the pouring language uh, is still in there, uh, and uh, yeah, this is where we we use it for 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 those who have uh, who are infants or whether those with mobility issues. Now. So yeah, I think we have maybe placing a little bit more uh, uh, emphasis in our preference for 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 immersion, uh, but without discounting that the other mode is possible. Not so much for practicality, but also scripturally, and the pouring out of the spirit uh, uh, is also linked closely to uh, baptism of the spirit as well. Yeah. Uh, I think, you know, it, well, perhaps it's worth saying that quite a few of the, 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 the elders and deacons at the time were thinking uh, immersions also is more normal. I think it's maybe perhaps our backgrounds or our leanings for that. Like, I, I think there's uh, two additional things to say to what Alex said. So the first one is uh, probably, we, we, it, in many ways, it's, it, it can be a better symbol. Uh, perhaps it's preferred as a symbol over the pouring, and therefore there's a preference towards that, the better picture of the dying and rising part. Uh, the second one is uh, is probably more pragmatic, right? Given that Baptists don't accept uh, baptism by effusion, then it just makes sense to, as much as possible, to baptize people by immersion, because then if the, in the future, if they ever leave Cross and Crown and they go to another church that doesn't accept baptism by uh, effusion, then they don't have any problems, because they've, that, that their baptism will be accepted. So in that sense, it just saves trouble for the, for the believer also if they ever go to a different, different church that has a different view. So it's the second one is it's practical for future, uh, yeah, for future uh, transfers. Uh, friends, we're continuing uh, in uh, the second sacrament uh, in the Lord's Supper, and uh, you see that in your notes. I think it's on page twelve for you. Is it? Is it page twelve for you? Yeah. So page twelve for you. Uh, just by means of introduction, uh, there are various names uh, for uh, this. Uh, various names given for the mean instituted by. Christ, commonly called the Lord's Supper. Uh, uh, the first one uh, is the Lord's Supper itself. You see that reference in one Corinthians eleven, and that's the and that's the that's the term that's the terminology we use uh, here at Cross and Crown. We uh, celebrate uh, the Lord's Supper, but there are other there are other uh, names given as well, and they also come from Scripture as well. Uh, Eucharist is from uh, one Corinthians eleven verse twenty four, and the idea uh, the idea there is Thanksgiving. Uh, Eucharist is the Greek word for uh, thanksgiving, uh, but also Holy Communion. Uh, so uh, uh, some, Methodist, uh, some Methodist churches still use that. Uh, and that's from 1 Corinthians 10, uh, verse 16. Uh, the idea there is uh, participation uh, or koinonia uh, or fellowship. Uh, a communion uh, is that uh, community feel to it, uh, Holy Communion. Okay, so they're just various names, uh, all of which have uh, 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 background in Scripture. Uh, Lord's Supper in the Bible. Uh, background, I will tell you background is the Passover. You might remember that when, uh, when God was going to bring the people of, Egypt, uh, people of Israel out of Egypt, uh, uh, he commanded them to uh, sacrifice a lamb, uh, paint uh, their doorposts with the blood of the lamb, eat, the, eat, uh, eat that lamb quickly, but also they had unleavened bread as well. Uh, and the point from there is that the final plague uh, was uh, the, uh, the death of the firstborn. And to escape Israel, uh, they were to uh, paint, not paint, but paint the blood of the perfect lamb on the doorpost. And after that, uh, the Passover was to be commemorated with a special meal. This will take place every year. Now coming into the New Testament, as Jesus uh, uh, introduce, uh, uh, celebrates uh, that Passover meal uh, just before his death. Uh, he then starts uh, adding uh, or, or giving extra words to it. Uh, now, there are three passages here. 
Uh, and I think uh, perhaps we could also uh, uh, briefly turn to the person next to you uh, and work through these passages. So maybe uh, Zach and uh, 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 Ming, you can work through the, the, first, uh, the first Matthew reference. Uh, maybe uh, some people, maybe these four here, you can work through the Mark 14 reference. Uh, and also uh, the rest, uh, you can work through uh, the Luke 22 reference. So uh, get, get to someone and, and work out. The question is, uh, here at the bottom is, how would you have understood the realistic language at the Last Supper if you are one of the disciples? In other words, as you were there, as you were listening to Jesus, as you were hearing his words, what would you be thinking? Okay, turn to the person next to you or to some uh, people close by and think about uh, what would you be thinking. Uh, just a few minutes. Okay, maybe let's come back together and uh, yeah, just hear from you what are, what are, what, what are, some, what are some things that, that you've discussed and what, you, what, what would the disciples have understood? What would you have understood if you were there uh, listening to what Jesus said? This is my body and this is my blood. Yeah, uh, so I think from uh, 26 to 29, we, from what we can understand is not, a, um, I guess to summarize this, we see it more as a symbol. He's referring to it symbolically. Because in, in 27, um, he, I think we, we mainly focus on the, on the second part, which is um, starting from 27, where Jesus is saying, drink, all, drink of it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the wine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So, um, because in 29, he refers to of the fruit of the wine. So, he's basically equating the, his blood to the wine in, in a symbolic sense. Uh, because if he, may, he, if he meant it literally, that means that um, it could also mean uh, one thing is how... Um, how, where, I think you're talking about um, a question of localization. Is like, does that mean that it's only that bottle of wine that is his blood of the covenant, even though the even though it can be effective for many, but then it opens up, it, it brings it to a different context. Yeah. Yeah. So your comment is that uh, uh, this is a, this is symbolic, uh, symbolic in that uh, uh, not just symbolic in terms of the uh, the the wine uh, in the in the new king, uh, in the father's kingdom, uh, but also, uh, is it only that cup? Doesn't it continue on? That's a good point. Uh, maybe from this group here, uh, any one of you? Uh, we read Mark fourteen. Uh, we, we agree with Zach. Uh, uh, because Jesus is there, so it couldn't mean the literal body as the bread or the blood as the wine. So there's some sense that they probably wouldn't have fully understood what, they, what, what, what Jesus was saying, because uh, I think the cross hasn't happened yet, uh, it's just coming after that. But in another sense, uh, there is, hey, how can you say this is my body when your body is still there? How can you say this is my blood, but your blood is still flowing in your veins? Uh, there is some uh, uh, gap between the two, and perhaps it's explained by symbolism. Uh, what about James or your group? Uh, I think my group, uh, we went through group 22, so uh, almost the same passage or so. And I think some of the questions we raised were like kind of like, oh, would the disciples have actually understood these things in the first place? Because if we were the disciples there, we wouldn't have understood anything. I think uh, we would have been fearful some more. So like, oh, Jesus, what have you done to this wine? That sort of thing. So it's a lot of like, yeah, it's a lot of not understanding. Then also, at the same time, also concern also like, oh, what do you mean suffer? Uh, like, isn't this another Passover? We've been together for like this amount of years already. Why is this Passover so significant? So I think it's just a lot of not really understanding what's going on. Yeah. So probably confusion. And yeah, confusion. Yeah. Worry maybe also. Yeah. Like, you know, he keeps talking about suffering and dying, yeah. but yeah. like, yeah. yeah. Maybe they go at the back. You want to uh, contribute anything?
Yeah, so I think we said a lot of what the previous groups have already said. Hmm. Um, but I think we also, um, yeah, we, we emphasized like the disciples, they wouldn't really know what was going yeah. on. Hmm. And then, um, so like for us in Luke 22, 23, it says that they began to question one another about who was going to betray Jesus. Yeah. So it's like they weren't even focusing on what he said. They were just more yeah. concerned about the, oh, one of you will betray me. Like, oh, who is yeah. it? You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Jesus says quite a few things there in Luke 22. Uh, but the idea is also, you know, would 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 they would they what would they have understood? Would they have understood fully? I think they may not have understood fully, uh, which will only be clear uh, when when we come to the uh, when the cross takes place. Uh, but I think definitely there is some. That I think one thing to take away is that there is some distance between when Jesus, this is my body. He's not my body. He's not saying my blood and brings out the bag of his blood. He's saying, look, his. Uh, this is this is symbolism. This is bread and wine, uh, and that's a that the symbolism continues to today, not literally uh, uh, his bread, uh, his body and blood. Okay, um, that's uh, very similar to, to to I think the the illustration that Tim was going to do just now in terms of showing a photo of Carissa. This is my body, but it's a symbol. It's a it's something that we point to, not at the actual actual person. Okay. Uh, so uh, just a point at the bottom there, uh, like baptism, the Lord's Supper is a sign and a seal of God's grace. Uh, it too points to the gospel of our Lord, uh, his sacrifice on our behalf and redemption through faith in his name. Uh, so it's a sign and a seal. Uh, uh, Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians, uh, there are two extra passages there. And I think the context there, if you can turn, if you can kind of turn there, or we'll look at, look at it here on the slides together. Uh, there are two passages there. Uh, and they operate in two different uh, uh, two different concerns that Paul had with the Corinthian church. Uh, first one uh, in one Corinthians ten, the issue there uh, is that the uh, uh, Corinthians were participating or eating food offered to idols. Uh, and here at, at the end of Paul's close to the end of Paul's argument, uh, let's look at what he says. He says there. Uh, therefore, my beloved, flee from, uh, flee from idolatry. Uh, I say as to sensible people, judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? Uh, the bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Uh, because there is one bread, uh, we who are many are one body. Uh, for we all partake of the one bread. Consider the people of Israel. Are those not who eat the sacrifices participants in the altar? Uh, Paul's goal here is to get them to think through uh, can they really go and eat uh, uh, food sacrificed to idols? But he makes uh, at least two important points here. Uh, one is that I think when we uh, uh, eat the bread and drink the cup, uh, what we're doing is that we are uh, in some kind of participation. Uh, the word there is koinonia, again, the idea of fellowship. Uh, and I think in the context of uh, uh, the way uh, uh, fellowship meals occur, particularly with God involved, uh, Christ is, in a sense, present. Uh, Christ is in a present. We are in communi community, communion with him, community with him, fellowship with him uh, as we eat the bread and the cup together. Uh, that's one. Uh, second thing I want to mention is that, that there is the reference to one body, isn't it? Uh, that uh, see, you're right. Yeah, so 17. Uh, so because there is one bread, we who are many are one body. Uh, for we all partake of the one bread. So there's a sense of uh, we don't just do it between us and God. Uh, we're actually doing it uh, together. Uh, doing it together uh, as one body, one uh, church. So that's the first uh, reference to uh, that's the first reference in 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 one Corinthians about the Lord's Supper. There's another one. Uh, this time the context is a little bit different. So one Corinthians eleven, uh, verse uh, seventeen to uh, thirty four. Uh, it's worth let's see reading it out uh, in full. Uh, so verse seventeen. Uh, but in the following instructions, I do not commend you. Because when you come together, uh, it is not for better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear 
that there are, there are divisions among you. And I believe in part, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the, blood, uh, the body and blood of the Lord. I'll let a person examine himself then, and so eat the bread and drink the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, uh, eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why so many of you are weak and ill and some have died. But if we judge ourselves truly, we, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. Uh, so then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. About the other things, I will give directions uh, when I come. You can see the problem, isn't it? That they, are, they think that they're celebrating the Lord's Supper, but actually they are not. Uh, because one goes hungry, they don't have food to eat, the poor, especially the poor, and then the rich are drunk, having drunk their wine. Uh, and in doing so, in not waiting for one another, in not sharing, uh, they are despising, it's a strong language, isn't it? They're despising the church of God. Uh, humiliating those who have nothing. And so as a, uh, because of that, Paul is saying, look, I told you this before, and it's something that I received uh, from the Lord. Uh, this is, uh, and, and he goes on to speak about uh, uh, the, 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 the sacrament, uh, the Lord's Supper, and how Jesus' body is for them, and uh, that new covenant is, is in his blood. So there is significance there. This is important. This is a, solemn thing and not to be abused. So it's pushing them to have a higher view of what's going on there. And it's particularly remembering Jesus and proclaiming his death. So what they're not to do is they're not to uh, eat unworthily, they are to eat in a worthy manner. Uh, uh, they are to eat in a worthy manner. If they are not, they are guilty. Uh, concerning who? Concerning the blood and body of the Lord. They are told to examine themselves, and they are told to discern uh, the body. Uh, so that's uh, a section on uh, 1 Corinthians. Uh, uh, 1 Corinthians has two sections on the Lord's Supper. Uh, uh, we're just going to press on a little bit. Uh, John chapter 6 uh, and the Lord's Supper. Uh, are they, uh, is John referring to the Lord's uh, Supper? And you see there, uh, in uh, uh, John 6, Jesus again uses that same language uh, as he speaks to, uh, I think, the religious leaders at the time who were, who were arguing with him. And in John 6, verse 53, uh, he says that, So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Uh, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. For the feeds of my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. Now you can imagine the people thinking, wow, cannibalism, makan orang. Scary. Scary language. But it's worth thinking back. Uh, uh, it's, uh, 
what we're looking at chapter 16 context, and in the context, much earlier, what Jesus means by eating his flesh and drinking his blood is this. The next slide. Uh, what he means is that he's saying, he's the bread of life, I'm the bread of life, whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. The point that Jesus is making is that, look, believe in me, trust in me. Uh, and you will not hunger, you will not thirst. And then he pushes that language a bit further at the end of, at the end of John 6 to say, eat my flesh and drink my blood. Uh, you will not thirst. Believe in him, believe in his sacrifice. Uh, now, is there then, is Jesus talking about uh, the Lord's Supper or not? Uh, the next slide, probably have this a bit more. Yeah. So, uh, in the Lord's Supper that we looked at, can you see? In the Lord's Supper that we looked at, you have, and the handout is also there as well. well uh, the progression of thought is that there's bread and wine uh, that's being used uh, at the Lord's Supper. And then what they do remember is they have to remember uh, Jesus to proclaim his death and resurrection, uh, to proclaim his uh, death. And in that sense, they are then to trust in Christ. Hold on to him. Keep continuing in faith. Uh, that's the Lord's Supper. Uh, but uh, in the in John six, I, the progression, of the the flow of thought begins with faith in Christ first. Believe in me, uh, and then he, Jesus pushes that language to feeding on him, feeding on Christ. Uh, so if you put the two together, uh, there is a distinction. You cannot go from bread and wine and then jump straight to uh, feeding on Christ. You cannot follow that dotted line. Uh, you have to go through uh, the solid line, as in faith in Christ, uh, starting from bread and wine, uh, remembering Jesus' death, encourages faith in Christ, and that faith in Christ then, and John 6, uh, then leads to thinking about feeding on Christ. So let me just uh, clarify what we mean by this. So. Uh, what we're saying is when we're eating the bread and the wine, we're not literally feeding on Christ, right? The doctrine of transubstantiation, we'll come to that uh, in a moment. So uh, often, you, often you see in uh, reform liturgies around the Lord's Supper uh, that they often talk about uh, feeding, uh, feeding on Christ uh, in the Lord's Supper. But what is meant by the language of feeding on Christ in the Lord's Supper is not feeding on him physically. Um, but feeding on him spiritually, right? uh, in the sense that John 6 is talking about. So John 6 is not, Jesus is not talking about the Lord's Supper. He's talking about uh, having eternal life through faith in him. Um, uh, and the, me uh, the metaphor that is used for faith is feeding on Christ or eating and, eating and drinking um, his, 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 his body and his blood. So, uh, that is a picture of, of faith. As you put your trust in Jesus, then spiritually you are feeding on him. Uh, just as bread gives, you need, you need to eat bread to survive. Right? If you don't eat, then you're going to die. In the same way, um, if you don't put your trust in Jesus, then you're not going to have et eternal life. Right? You need, uh, it's only Jesus who can uh, give you uh, that, uh, that life through faith in him. Right? So, uh, you, you can join them together in this way, right? So if the Lord's Supper is all about remembering Jesus' death with faith and having your faith in him strengthened, then in that sense, as you take the bread and the wine and you're trusting in Jesus' death to save you and his death alone, then in that sense, you are spiritually feeding on him, right? feeding on him by faith. Right? So in an Anglican church, you'd say, take and eat this um, in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your heart by faith. So it's a spiritual feeding. It's not a physical feeding. The reason we have to say this is because Roman Catholicism will uh, go to uh, John chapter 6 to argue for transubstantiation. And, and they, will, they will go to this passage to argue, look, unless you eat of, um, eat of Jesus' uh, body and drink of his blood, then you have no life in you. And then therefore, unless you are part of the Roman Catholic Church and you are 
partaking of Jesus' physical body and blood through the mass, then you cannot be saved. Right? That's the argument of Roman Catholicism, um, and that's that, that's what this is trying to address here. Thanks, Tim. Any questions? Um, yeah, thanks, Pastor Alex. So I had a question about the John 6 passage. Um, so, yeah, in John, Jesus makes many metaphorical I am statements, right? Mm. He says things like, I am the door, I am the light of the world, I am mm. the, the good shepherd, and so on. Yeah. And in all of these other statements, he's obviously speaking metaphorically, lah, right? Mm. Like, he's clearly mm. not a door, right? Or he's clearly not, yeah. you know, a bright yeah. light. Yeah. Um, and we all know this, and all of his listeners know this, because they just accepted it. Mm. Like, there was no controversy, there mm. was no argument. Mm. But I think what's interesting about this John 6 passage mm. is that there is controversy. Mm -hmm. And all the Jews and the listeners, mm -hmm. you know, it says the Jews grumbled mm -hmm. about him, right? Verse 41. Mm -hmm. And then even in, in verse 60, even the disciples, when they heard it, they said, wow, this is a hard saying. Mm -hmm. Who can listen to it? Mm -hmm. So if it was very clearly a metaphor, why is there so much controversy? Why is this the only uh, I am statement that generates controversy, that generates mm -hmm. this dissent, mm -hmm. right? And in fact, it goes to the extent uh, that 666, a very mm. appropriate number, mm. just many of the disciples turn back and no longer walk with him. Mm. Mm. And so if Jesus meant it metaphorically, symbolically, mm. then how come he didn't just explain it? Because we know in the past, he's explained his parables before. Mm. So he's not averse to explaining symbolic or metaphorical yeah. language. Yeah. But here, you know, when he sees all these people getting scandalized, he could have said, oh, hey, guys, hold on, hold on. I don't mean cannibalism, I'm talking symbolically. No, but what does he say? He says, oh, do you take offense? Verse 61. Mm. Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? Mm. Right? The Spirit gives mm. life, the flesh is of no help. Mm. So he's saying that, I mean, this is, yeah, you can't understand this in a physical way, right? Wow, oh, just eating my flesh, just drinking my blood. Wow, oh, scandalous. But no, I mean, guys, this is, I mean, like, I'm God, right? <laughs> Basically, he's saying I'm God. Mm -hmm. And like the Spirit works in, in these ways that, that we just can't understand. Um, so yeah, I mean, I just want to make that point, right? That it's a very controversial metaphorical yeah. statement. Yeah. It is really metaphorical. Yeah. Um, and then the second thing I want to say um, is that, you know, just thinking back to what we talked about earlier, right? The Last Supper narrative. Mm. So this John 6 thing happens before the Last Supper. Mm -hmm. So Jesus says these things. And then the disciples themselves, you know, are scratching heads, everything. Mm. And the conclusion that Peter sums up uh, in, where, in verse 68. Yeah. Right? Jesus says, well, yeah. everyone else, Jabut, you want to go away as well. Verse 68, Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Right? So the disciples, they've seen the controversy. They choose to stay with Jesus. And they remember. Mm. They remember mm. what Jesus has said mm. about his body, about mm. his blood, mm. about eating it, mm. drinking it. Mm. And this happens before the Last Supper, right? Mm. So I think at the Last Supper, when Jesus says, Hey guys, this is my body, this is my blood. I think maybe some of them, if they are not too blur blur, maybe after a while they might remember lah. Mm. Hey, in the past didn't you know that big hoo ha, that big controversy, yeah. Huh? Yeah. Didn't Jesus say something about eating his body, about drinking mm -hmm. his blood? Yeah, that's all I want to say. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I think, but just because of the reaction of the people, I, it doesn't mean that it's not metaphorical anymore, lah. Um, I don't know whether it's it's it whether it highlighted a bit more that this is therefore not metaphorical. Uh, yeah, I think there. Are, if you talk about the parables, he would choose to explain to some and not to all either. It was the disciples that he explained it to, but the rest he would say, no, they I I put it in parables so that they will not hear. Uh, of course, I think in the end, uh, those written for us. Uh, put put down in, in the Gospels for us. We read it and we can see the interpretation. But there's a sense that this is not fully clear just yet. And I think he's challenging them to think about what bread are they looking for? And that's the start of the whole thing. Right? Yeah, so that's one way to think about, oh, is it actually extra significant whether this is perhaps not a metaphor because of all the controversies that happen? Uh, yeah, I'm not so sure about that. Right? Uh, I think um, the second point. Oh, that 
um, about the Last Supper, right? Yeah. So if Jesus hadn't said yeah. anything about his body yeah. before, yeah. then yeah. Yeah. So I think yeah, whether whether or not they actually they actually line the dots together, I think we will see all throughout that they don't they're not very good at joining the dots together, right? In the point where Jesus says, uh, I will die and rise again sometimes three times and they still they still don't know that Jesus is gonna come back to life. So I think this could be one of those things that they will only be only be clear uh, as the cross uh, uh, happened. So does it change the way uh, whether this is lit more literal than, than it needs to be or not? Yeah, I'm not sure. Hmm. I'll just quickly mention the point uh, it following. What does the Lord's Supper signify and achieve? Uh, so first, remembering Jesus' death, we saw that quite clearly uh, in 1 Corinthians 10. Uh, two, nourishing faith. Uh, spiritually feeding on Christ. Uh, three, participation. Uh, this the, the fellowship uh, with, uh, not just uh, with the Lord, but with other Christians as well. Uh, next section deals with uh, historical theology. Tim, you want to take that? Yeah, I mean, I, we were having a bit of that discussion just, uh, just now with those uh, comments that were being made. Uh, but yeah, this is just tracing it through. We've, so we've looked at the Bible's teaching uh, but, but it was the case that quite early on in the church, they, uh, that things moved towards the doctrine of, of uh, transubstantiation. It was only officially kind of adopted, I think, 1215 at the Fourth Lateran Council. But uh, in a lot of early church writings, it moves quite quickly towards uh, the idea that, uh, I guess in, in, in trying to reverence uh, the, the sacrament, it moves towards actually... Uh, thinking that it's a literal body and blood and therefore elevating and, and, and worshipping the uh, uh, worshipping because it's, it's, it's transubstantiated, it's changed its form. Trans means change, substance means its, uh, its essence or its being. So it looks like bread and wine, but it's changed to be the literal, uh, literal body and blood of Jesus. And then because it's literally Jesus, then it should be, uh, be worshipped and, and adored as if you were worshipping uh, worshiping Jesus, so that's that. That, that was the teaching of of uh, Roman Catholicism, and uh, and so in the Mass, the idea is that you are re-presenting or you are re-sacrificing Jesus. That's why they call it an altar, not a table. Um, that's why you have priests in robes and so on, because you're basically uh, representing Jesus' uh, sacrifice over and over again, symbolically, um, in the bread and wine, and that's why they will. Uh, elevate the cup for people to, uh, to to worship and so on. Uh, so this was uh, this was recognised in the Reformation as idolatrous, basically, because it's it's not uh, the literal uh, body and blood of Jesus, and so to worship anything that is not God is idolatrous, right? So Luther uh, Luther starts off, and uh, Luther's view was consubstantiation. Uh, essentially, what Jesus, what Luther is arguing is that the, he's rejecting transubstantiation. It's not the literal body and blood of Jesus, but he still wanted to insist that Jesus was physically present in the Lord's Supper. Uh, he he says he doesn't know how to explain it. It's kind of mysterious and uh, and so on. But he's somehow present physically in the Lord's Supper, in and under uh, the, the 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 bread and the wine. Yeah. Um, so he rejects transubstantiation, but he insists on a physical presence. That's consubstantiation. Uh, that was rejected by the other reformers, Zwingli and Calvin and so on. Zwingli put, uh, seemed to place more emphasis on uh, the Lord's Supper as a memorial or remembrance, uh, whereas Calvin uh, invested more uh, meaning in it in the sense of uh, he insisted on a the spiritual presence. So he said he, uh, Calvin uh, taught that Jesus is... Is present with us as we uh, celebrate the Lord's Supper, but he's not present physically. Um, he's present by his by his Holy Spirit, uh, and so in that sense, it's a real uh, fellowship. There's a real communion or real fellowship that's happening with Jesus as we eat and drink, but not a physical, uh, not a physical one. Right. So that's uh, uh, that, that's Calvin's teaching, and that's the teaching that is taken up by the Reformed churches like Anglicanism, Presbyterianism. Um, and, 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 and so on, right, is it's, it's Calvin's teaching. Luther's teaching, obviously, is uh, Lutheranism, um, and, uh, and uh, Zwingli's teaching, well, some, some, 
some churches tend towards that by default, I think, uh, in terms of seeing it merely as a memorial. Um, but uh, a lot of reform teaching will actually insist on a spiritual presence. So you see that reflected uh, then in the, in, in the articles here. Uh, let me just read these. Uh, the Supper of the Lord, this is a 39 articles. The Supper of the Lord is not only a sign of the love that Christians ought to have among themselves, one to another, but rather as a sacrament of our redemption by Christ's death, insomuch that to such as rightly, worthily, and with faith receive the same, the bread with which we partake is a partaking of the body of Christ, and likewise the cup of blessing, a partaking in the blood of Christ. Transubstantiation or the change of the substance of bread and wine in the Supper of the Lord cannot be proved by holy writ, that is Scripture but it is repugnant or repulsive to the plain words of Scripture, overthrows the nature of a sacrament, and has the given occasion to many superstitions. The body of Christ is given, taken, and eaten in the supper only after an heavenly and spiritual manner, and the mean whereby the body of Christ is received and eaten in a supper is faith. So it's a spiritual feeding by faith. It's not a physical eating, right? And therefore, you shouldn't reserve it, carry it about, lift it up, worship it. That's idolatrous, right? Uh, this, the, the next one there uh, says that uh, the wicked and such as void of lively faith, although they do kindly and visibly press with their teeth the sacrament uh, of the body and blood, yet in no wise are they partakers. So in other words, if you're not a, not a believer, you don't, you don't have faith in Jesus, then eating the bread and the wine is not going to do anything for you. And it's not some superstitious thing. You eat the bread and the wine, you're going to get some healing or some blessing from God, even though you're not a believer. No, 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 it doesn't work like that. Right? Um, in fact, you are eating and drinking judgment on yourself. Right? Uh, you are to, people are to have both the bread and the wine. That's the next one, because in Roman Catholicism, they withhold um, the cup in case you spill it. Yeah? Um, and the, the next one talks about the complete finished work uh, of, of Jesus. Any, any questions there in terms of the uh, uh, historical theology? Uh, with regards to Calvin's view of uh, the real presence by the Spirit, I'm quite confused as to how that works or what exactly that means. Um, yeah, because doesn't the Spirit normally, as believers, doesn't the Spirit indwell us already? So what is the significance here then? Is it... Yeah, it, it seems like the remembrance part I can see, but the spirit part I don't. Yeah, right. Yeah, so of course uh, the, uh, the temple temple language is used both individually and corporately in the New Testament. So uh, 1 Corinthians 6 will, will say that that we are a uh, uh, temple of the Holy Spirit. His spirit dwells in us. So that's the case. That's, that's true of us individually. But it's also uh, true of us uh, corporately as well. So if you were to pick up uh, Ephesians chapter uh, 2, for example, which we looked at earlier this this year in our sermon series, uh, it talks about how uh, in him the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So uh, together corporately as, uh, as the church, God dwells in us uh, uh, by, his, by his Spirit. And, and he does so particularly when we are gathered together, right? So again, to pick up from Matthew's Gospel, Jesus says, uh, when two or three are gathered in my name, I, I'm, I'm there, there with them. But he's not physically present. Um, all right, I can't see Jesus kind of sitting in any of the chairs uh, here, right? He's not physically present, but he is present with us. He's present by his Holy Spirit as we gather together in, in his name, around his word, and, and so on. He's, he's spiritually present. And so that's what Calvin is, is emphasizing. As we celebrate the Lord's Supper, it is his, it's the meal that, that he gave us that is symbolizes union with him in his death and his resurrection, then because uh, it's a participation in his body and, and and his blood, it's a sharing with him or fellowship in his in, in his in his death. So it's saying that he is he's present with us as we as we eat the meal. He is um, he's uh, spiritually present by yeah, by the Holy Spirit. So if we were not to if a church were to, for example, only take it once a year or once a decade, for example, a really special event, I don't know, does that mean that Christ is not present corporate? Uh, no, it doesn't mean that at all. Um, because uh, ultimately Christ is, is, is he's present with us by his spirit indwelling us, but he's also present through his word, right? So his, 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 uh, the, the word is the spirit's, the spirit's word and so on. Uh, and that's why in the in the reform tradition you never you never uh, uh, 
administer the sacrament, baptism or the Lord's Supper, apart from the, the preaching of the Word of God. Remember how we defined the sacraments at the start as they are a visible words, they are visible pictures uh, of the gospel. And so the practice is you would, never, you would never administer the visible word apart from the preaching of, of, of the gospel itself, right? Um, uh, because it's the, the, the uh, actions itself, the, the, the bread and the wine, the, the baptism itself, you won't understand the significance of that apart from the explanation of, of, of the gospel, the preaching, uh, the preaching of the gospel. Um, and, and so as, as, as the word of God is, is preached, Christ is, Christ is addressing us and Christ is, is present among us and he's at work in our hearts changing us. Uh, and, and and so on, right? So and and in the same way that uh, Christ is present as His Word is preached um, to His people, He's also present as the um, visible Word is, is is given to the people too by His Spirit. Uh, does that make sense? Okay, I don't want us to go too over time here, so uh, let's just do a <laughs> uh, speed dating through these uh, through these questions, right? How should we take it? Thankfully, look back with thankfulness in your heart, humbly after self-examination and repentance, trustingly, so you are putting your faith in Jesus and his death. I'm on page 16. Uh, uh, lovingly, right, uh, remembering that uh, we do, it, do this in, uh, in response to God's love and loving one another and expectantly anticipating the future when we're going to feast at Christ's uh, table in heaven. Should we dip or drink? Oh, the, I think uh, it doesn't matter in the end. I mean, during COVID, there was a lot of uh, dipping going on, and I mean, uh, uh, sorry, the in, we owned the individual cups, and there was no dipping because people were worried about all this stuff or not sharing any common cups or whatever. Actually, the, this, the symbolism is better from a common cup because there's the idea of sharing of one thing together. But you can also express that by say drinking at the same time. Uh, it, it doesn't really matter. How often should we celebrate? Must it be weekly? No, I think the idea is as often as you drink it, uh, in 1 Corinthians 11, suggests it's regular, uh, so it, it doesn't have to be all the time, but regularly. Can you use Ribena? Well, I think Jesus used wine. Those who argue that he didn't, I, think, I don't know how they arrive at that. Uh, I, I suppose you could for you know for youth or something if you didn't want them drinking wine, but wine is better as the symbol. What if I'm not baptized or confirmed? Can I still take it? Well, in uh, uh, theologically, you you could take it if you were a believer. You know, if you were truly you know received the baptism of the Spirit, you're truly a Christian. Then theologically, I suppose that you could. But it, it's it becomes a matter of church order as well. Whenever you are a part of a, a, a gathering of God's people, we have certain rules about how we how we do things, and churches uh, develop their rules on this. And so in most, uh, most uh, reformed denominations, you cannot take it unless you are baptized. And I assume that we will adopt something similar to that here. Um, I would hope so. Can I take the Lord's Supper at home? Uh, well, the whole idea is that it's meant to be a family meal, that you do it together. So you may meant to eat it together. I mean, this is, again, a dilemma during COVID. Can we eat it, on the, eat it together? <laughs> at our homes while we watch on Zoom. Well, in a sense you can, although it's not the same being gathered online as being gathered physically like this. Uh, so it's not ideal, but it's probably okay. Do you need the pastor to administer it? No, you don't. But the, the practice in most churches is that you require it to be uh, overseen by the elders of, or the leaders of the church so that it's done properly. Yeah. Um, but it's not, uh, there's no verse in the Bible that, that says that. It's more the the desire to have order and to do things right. Okay, let me pass over to Alex. Right. I'll right, come to a section that we've had discussion before about whether children can participate uh, in the Lord's Supper. And uh, this, is, this is what the term is. Uh, what about pedo communion? So let's uh, define certain things. Uh, so definition, we define pedo communion as admittance of a covenant child to the Lord's Supper on the basis of his descent from at least one professing Christian parent. So it's basically saying that uh, children can participate in a Lord's Supper if they have at least one believing uh, parent. That's one way to define it. Uh, prevalence. Uh, so whether it's, uh, whether it's common or not. Uh, so here it says, although it remains a minority position, pedo communion has, 
had vocal support within the conservative reform community. And most reform theologians and all reform confessions have concluded the contrary. So, uh, so there is this, uh, uh, how do I say, this situation where uh, it's a minority position, uh, but quite a few people, quite a few denominations uh, elsewhere have, uh, uh, in different countries, particular countries are not in general, have adopted this, that they can have uh, children participate. And these are from within reform communities. But theologians and historical confessions, so some of the things that we looked at before, uh, they, uh, in terms of historically, they haven't uh, been included. Uh, just look at, uh, let's see, uh, another, another quote there. Uh, Though the practice of pedo communion, uh, uh, long confined to Eastern Orthodoxy, has gained some currency in liberal and high church Protestant circles, uh, most evangelical Protestant pedo Baptists and credo Baptists agree that the Lord's table is only for those who are trusting in Jesus Christ. In other words, uh, it's only for those who uh, believe in Jesus. Uh, so the, particip the proper participants in the Lord's Supper are those who trust in Jesus Christ alone for their salvation as he's offered in the gospel and have received the sign of membership or baptism in the body of Christ, his church. The Lord's Supper is for professing believers in the Lord, uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ uh, who have discerned the body of the Lord, that is, the church. Uh, now, uh, arguments for pedo communion that means what reasons are there to believe that children can participate. So first, our children in the Old Testament were admitted to the annual Passover meal. And so it's inferred from Exodus chapter 12 uh, that children participated because uh, they get to ask the question, uh, what does this mean? Uh, the, uh, the, the quote there says, since children were admitted, so the, in other words, the, the logic then is, if they can participate in the Old Testament Passover, Therefore, here it says, since the children were admitted to the old covenant feast, anticipating the death of Christ yet to come, it is argued, therefore, children under the new covenant ought to participate, uh, ought to partake of the feast celebrating the finished death of Christ. So because uh, children were, were, were thought to have uh, uh, participated in the, in the Passover, therefore children can participate in the Lord's Supper. That's one uh, reason. Second reason. Uh, the prevailing concern of 1 Corinthians 11, uh, 17 to 14, is unity. It's inconsistent with excluding children. Remember, discerning the body, uh, not leaving any, anyone behind, eating together. Well, if we do that, are we excluding children? Uh, so the quote that says, uh, the, the, the paragraph that says, division exists in how uh, participating in the Lord's Supper and it's uh, these factions that constitute participating in an unworthy manner. Uh, examining oneself, therefore, is to ensure the unity of fellowship of the body. So we eat together, children included, so that we maintain this unity, we present this unity, we uh, uphold this unity rather than exclude anyone. Another one from 1 Corinthians, 7, uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 11, uh, and this is in particular thinking about uh, children's ability, whether they have the ability to discern or examine themselves, or whether, or whether they are in danger of eating unworthily. Uh, so the, point, the, the main point there, uh, uh, Paul addresses the, this, Paul is, the context there is that Paul is addressing disobedient adults, uh, not immature children. So he's drawing a bit of an exclude. Uh, so there's an exclusion here or exception here. I'll read a quote there. Uh, yet there is nothing in the text which suggests that in, it is immature, it is the immature who are in jeopardy of eating unworthily. Rather, it is the disobedient who run the risk of eating and drinking judgment upon themselves. If children are not guilty of the kind of misconduct described by Paul, then it follows that Paul's warning do not apply to them. In other words, if the children are not behaving like the adults, disobedient in that way, then hey, this rule doesn't quite apply to them. Another, another paragraph there, another argument. Uh, uh, participants in a covenant meal are required to be in covenantal fellowship and that covenantal fellowship is evidenced through God's grace by covenantal obedience. In other words, their obedience to their parents uh, is one, and, their, and, to, and to the gospel, uh, it's, it, they can then participate in the meal. Yet it is a mistake uh, to judge the faithfulness of an individual solely in terms of mature self-examination or an articulate profession of faith. 
evidence of covenant standing is cor correlative to one's age. An understanding appropriate to the age, however, does not necessarily imply that children have the ability to articulate the meaning of the sacrament in adult thought forms. In other words, our children can only understand so much, uh, they, have, they have certain ability, uh, so we not expect them to have a full-blown, uh, full understanding of what we're doing today uh, in order to then participate. Say, okay, children can understand some things, uh, should we include them in the, in, the, in the meal because of what they can understand, particularly what they can understand about the gospel, about the symbol. Uh, so that's, one, that's another line of argument. Uh, fourth one, Christian membership uh, by virtue of baptism automatically gives access to the Lord's Supper. In other words, if you baptize them as children, shouldn't you include them in a Lord's Supper as well? That's basically uh, what this point is about. Um, and then also the uh, fifth point there is it's a practice, practice of the early church. Uh, so, pedo, so the paragraph in uh, uh, E there, is paedo communists often argue that paedo communion is an ancient, is an ancient long-standing Christian practice uh, worthy of the contemporary church's uh, consideration. Uh, so, the, so those are five reasons uh, 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 or five arguments for why uh, children should participate uh, in, uh, in our Lord's Supper. That's, that's how people put it together. I'll let Tim uh, uh, present or arguments against that. Uh, why we should only have adults participate. Right. I mean, this is to uh, this is really a summarizing what you'll find in that book, Children and the Lord's Supper. So I think if you want the longer argument, then you you want to read that that book. But so a uh, because there's a connection with Passover and the Lord's Supper doesn't mean that they're exactly the same necessarily. Uh, it's not guaranteed that the children ate the Passover meal, but even if they did, that doesn't necessarily mean they should eat the Lord's Supper. In a similar way with, uh, you think about uh, baptism, right, that uh, uh, circumcision was only given to men in the Old Testament, eight-year-old boys, right? But baptism is given to both genders. There's a difference between circumcision and baptism at that point. So you, you, it's not the case, oh, okay, it was, circumcision was only for boys, so therefore baptism is only for boys. You've got to be careful in how you move from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Secondly, there are serious consequences for participating in an unworthy manner. Right? He talks about eating and drinking judgment on yourself. And uh, so you want to be very, very sure that you're right before you have young children who don't really understand what they're doing, doing something that can potentially attract God's judgment on them. Right? Um, so the idea that you need to examine yourself, um, uh, and, and so the common practice in uh, celebrating the Lord's Supper is that before you participate, you will confess your sins, you'll reflect on your failures before God, and, and, and so on. Uh, and and that, re that reflection on, uh, on what was, what's the Lord's Supper about, and what's, where, how's my heart before God, how am I treating other people, it's not something that certainly babies can do, um, and, or, or, or perhaps uh, very, very young children. Um, and so, in that sense, it's not for uh, it's not wise for them to participate. Uh, C. Some privileges can only be exercised later, right? So, by denying Lord's Supper to children, you're not saying that they're not members of the church. If you deny baptism to children, then you are denying them membership in the church, right? because baptism is the sign of membership in the church. So, uh, by denying uh, by denying communion to children, you are not saying that they're not members of the church in the way that the, the, the Credo Baptist would. Um, but what you're saying is that you can't enjoy all rights immediately. Um, uh, this is similar to what we do in, uh, with our church membership here. You read our constitution. To be an official member of the church here, you need to be 18 plus, right, and baptized and so on, right? You can't be an elder or deacon and have various positions if you are not 18 and over, right? Um, it's the same with voting. You can be a Malaysian citizen, right? Uh, as a Malaysian citizen, you have the right of voting. But you can't exercise your right of voting until you are you're 18. You can't run for parliament unless you're over a certain age and so on. So you have the right by virtue of uh, being a citizen, but you can't exercise it immediately. And so that's the argument that's made for uh, made here. Uh, yes, as a as a as a baptized child, you have the right of participating 
because of a separate it's a privilege that is yours but you can't exercise it until uh, until later on yeah uh and uh and then of course uh, the reform tradition gives no historical precedent in the end we've got to argue from scripture yeah um but the reformed church has rejected this pretty much uniformly the other point was well the early church accepted that well, the early church also accepted transubstantiation and stuff as well, isn't it? So you can't just because it's been practiced or even widely practiced doesn't mean it's right, isn't it? In the end, we need to go back to uh, uh, go back to the scriptures. So how would this look like in practice uh, to re- to accept infant baptism but to reject pedo communion? Well, it's something like this. So you can this is how Presbyterian Church would do it, a, re- a reformed denomination. Children of believers are, through the covenant and by right of birth, non-communing members of the church. So they're members, but non-communing. So they're members by virtue of baptism, but they're not uh, communing in terms of the Lord's Supper. Hence, they are entitled to baptism, to pastoral oversight, instruction, and the government of the church, with a view to their embracing Christ and thus possessing personally all the benefits of the covenant Communing members are those who have made a profession of faith in Christ, have been baptized and been admitted by the session to the Lord's table. They are entitled to the rights and privileges uh, of, uh, of the church. In this way, we may honor the scriptures teaching that the children of believers are members of the church by birthright, but also recognize there are certain privileges that may not be lawfully exercised until maturation or maturity. Um, so I guess in our context, we're not a we're not a Presbyterian church. We don't have a session or anything like that. But I guess the idea would be that uh, uh, they would first need to be baptized, and then uh, they would uh, they would have some kind of interview or something with their elders in order to get approval you know, to participate in the Lord's Supper. That's how that would be applied here. Yeah. Okay, I'll stop there. Any any questions you want to ask about Peter? Kuhn? Sorry, I just had a question about the frequency of it because the Lord's Supper is celebrated once a year by the Israelites. So I'm just wondering where the monthly or weekly things they celebrate from. it. They celebrate the Passover annually. Yeah, <laughs> uh, um, the Lord's Supper is not the Passover. Yeah, yeah. Uh, One Corinthians eleven says, "As often as you drink it," which suggests that it's regular, but it doesn't say how often. Yeah. But given that it's a means of grace and it's something that's meant to strengthen your faith in Jesus and so on, then it makes sense to do it regularly. It's good for you to do it regularly. But it doesn't say that is regularly, weekly, fortnightly, monthly, quarterly. Uh, different churches have different practices. Uh, when it talks about the privileges, uh, looking at the Presbyterian view again, right, um, What's the biblical backing for there are certain privileges that they may not lawfully exercise? Right. So it's it's going back to the previous argument that uh, in order to uh, we you, you must we must make sure we don't participate in the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. Otherwise, you uh, risk uh, eating and drinking judgment on yourself. Um, and and part of that means you need to therefore examine yourself and discern the body and um, and, and and so on. So the, what, the, what that means is uh, that uh, whereas, for, uh, whereas for baptism it's a sign of, it's a sign of membership and it's, 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 it's God taking you to be one of his children by virtue of being in a Christian family and so on. Um, for the Lord's Supper, which is a symbol of ongoing communion with Christ, you need to un- understand what you are, are doing. Um, and now you might be... It doesn't give an age limit to this. You might be uh, you might be six years old or eight years old and able to understand it, and then you're accepted by the elders. You can do it, right? So it's yeah, but there must be some kind of um, understanding of what you're doing. That that's what's being said. So I have two questions. One is on I guess on um there was a point on whether we can take the lot supper at home, right? So what are some I guess let's say um. I guess the question is, what is the church's view on maybe like a CG having taking the Lord's Supper um, when they meet up for like maybe a potluck or something, you know? And I so so that's my first question. And I guess another, uh, yeah, sure. I mean, this is one of the things about being an independent church. Uh, 
as it stands, you look at our constitution, uh, it, it doesn't really say much about th these various uh, theological matters. Whereas if you think about, you know, Anglican Church has got their 39 articles and Presbyterians got their Westminster Confession of Faith and so on. You've got these, these long things and then they've got all of their, you know, guidelines that they've worked out through the various uh, you know, synods and meetings that they've had over sessions they've had over the years to de decide, okay, this is how we are going to conduct ourselves as, as a dominant denomination, and these are the, the rules of how we're, we're, we're going to do it, right? So if you look at the, you know, the various denominations, they will have rules that will, for example, exclude you from, uh, you know, uh, from having someone who's not a pastor or not an elder from presiding over the Lord's Supper and not doing it at home and these kinds of things, right? But as an independent church, uh, we don't have any policies about those things, and that's the point of the seminar here is we need to understand it because in the end you do need to have a view on it right uh, because otherwise it's going to be a, a, a free-for-all and it's going to be confusing for everyone or there might be conflict or whatever so you know is it okay for our for your dg to, to to do the lord's supper together well that's something that the church leadership in the end needs to think about theologically and give some guidance on it yeah uh, i can tell you my personal view is that it's a bad idea um, but that's different to saying that um, that's the church's view. So, yeah, that, that's that's where we're at as a church, I guess. We need we're, we're trying to study the scriptures and de and develop the policy that will then guide our our um, our behaviour together. So I guess it's kind of more more of a, um, who is the who, who is administering and the scope of it, I guess. In that yeah, sense. I mean theologically, there's nothing to say that you couldn't have the Lord's Supper together, although the, uh, generally you have, it's meant to be a family meal, and that's kind of the problem in 1 Corinthians 11, where you've got some people eating and some people not eating, and it's meant to be something that you do together, you see. So uh, it, it doesn't really make sense for a small part of the church to celebrate without the whole congregation being, uh, being present. So in that sense, it's a bad idea, yeah. Um, but... Uh, yeah, so I, I wouldn't do that. But, uh, but we don't have any rules, that, specific rules that say, uh, that disallow it. Yeah. Um, my second question is on the, I guess it's kind of a general question in a sense, where in, or when Jesus gives the blood, he says, drink, or this is my, my covenant, right? Or this is the um, blood of the new covenant. Blood of the new covenant, yeah. And so, in a sense, um, it's kind of it's symbolizing his sacrifice and everything. Would this, can this be analogous to how the Israelites were giving sacrifices in the time of, um, like in, in, in God's command, in like for their sins and everything, all the offerings? Uh, so that's the first one. And the second one is um, following on on that train of thought. In that, I, I don't know whether you would be able to answer it. Or were children also participative in the Leviticus, um, or do it was kind of like. Uh, sacrifice offerings in that period. Okay. Uh, to take the first question, uh, that's talking about the inauguration of the covenant. So in the old covenant, the inauguration happens, I think it's in Exodus 24, uh, and they throw blood in various places on the people and on the, on the books and so on. That's the so in order to inaugurate a covenant, it's always inaugurated with blood. And the idea is that if you break the covenant, then your blood is going to be spilled like, <laughs> uh, like what happened there. Um, and so when, uh, when, Jesus' death becomes the blood that is spilled that inaugurates the new covenant. What's the new covenant? That's the covenant that's promised, say, in Jeremiah 31, that involves the forgiveness of, uh, of sins. So it's not linking to the regular sacrificial system. It's going back to the inauguration of the covenant at Sinai, Exodus 24. Uh, and Jesus is inaugurating a new covenant to make the old covenant obsolete. Yeah. So I think that, I mean, therefore, it doesn't really apply to the second <laughs> Um, second question. Yeah. Uh, Pastor, could you say more about what it means to participate unworthily in the in Holy Communion? Um, because, like with the pedo communion thing, right? Like to me, if it's just a remembrance or like a, a memorial, then to explain to a kid, oh, Jesus loves you. Jesus died for you. We do this to remember him. I mean, to me, it seems quite intuitive, quite quite simple. But is that, like, yeah, how can we participate unworthily, right, in, in this spiritual... There are two uh, things that are said in the following verse. It talks about examining, uh, let a person examine himself, uh, and uh, you need to discern the body. 
uh, what's meant by discerning the body at that point? I, I don't think it's so much talking about discerning uh, uh, Christ's body, as in the body and blood of uh, representing the body and blood of Christ, but it's discerning the body as in the church. So in, the, in chapter 10, it talks about uh, we are all um, uh, we are all one body, therefore we eat of one one bread, and it's quite clear that the, the body there is the, the church, right? Um, uh, God's God's people. So in other words, you you, you must uh, be uh, participating with your uh, with loving loving uh, loving the members ar- around you. But it's more than that. It's also you need to examine yourself, examining your heart, uh, your heart before before God. Am I am I living rightly towards God? Am I am I loving my neighbour and so on? So I think it's uh, yet part of it is uh, thinking about how am I treating the people around me. But more than that, it, uh, examining uh, how is my heart how is my heart before. Before, before God. Thank you. Okay, I think we probably need to wrap up. Um, can you grab my phone over there? There's a few questions that were sent by WhatsApp I want to answer as well. Uh, in terms of wrapping up, in terms of the Lord's Supper, I think uh, if you ask my own personal view, I, I, I definitely will go for the, the traditional reform view, which would involve accepting infant baptism and rejecting pedo communion. Uh, but I realize that not all of us will necessarily be convinced of of, of that particular view, and uh, I think to c- conclude, other I mean, we are calling ourselves a Protestant Reformed Church, so th- these are the Reformed views on things. So if we were consistent with that, then this is, this is how we would generally uh, approach uh, approach things. Uh, but I realize that there might be diversity of of views there. Uh, okay, before we have the conclusion, let me just uh, read. Uh, Enter these couple of questions that came in on the on the chat. Okay, so uh, number one, for clarification, do we recognise baptism done in the Catholic Church? Uh, in that case, rebaptism should be done. Uh, Reformed denominations do accept uh, uh, baptism done in a Catholic Church because it is done in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay. Uh, uh, second, if baptism is a sign of the new birth and of initiation, inclusion into God's people. Then how does pedo baptism uh, show or show or support this? Uh, well, what we are what we are saying is with pedo baptism is that um, we are we are uh, including uh, children as members of the visible church. So by bapti- by baptizing children, you are not saying that they are regenerated, right? Because you are, what you are saying is that they are members of the visible church, and then we pray that as their parents disciple them and they're brought up in the context of the church, that they will then experience uh, the, the regeneration in their heart. Of course, they might not be able to think of a particular time where, um, you know, a turning point where they accepted Christ, um, but uh, that, that's the idea. So uh, baptism is... We're not baptizing because uh, they are regenerate. We're, we're baptizing to show that they are members of the church, uh, with a view praying that they would one day uh, experience the reality. Uh, what makes someone a believer, part of God's people in the new covenant, is the new birth, repentance of sins, and faith in Christ. And so, the Creed of Baptist stands that baptism should be the should be only for professing believers. Uh, but not infants. Yes, that's that's what they would believe. As parents, we still teach them uh, the gospel, include them in church, but trust God to bring about repentance and faith in them. Uh, Peter Baptist would do the same. Uh, baptism is the sign of the reality. Spirit baptism, repentance and faith. So shouldn't water baptism follow when this is the reality, when a person child shows signs of repentance and faith? Well, that's going to be the normal. Uh, that, that would be the normal means. Um, but again, going back to the analogy of uh, circumcision, if you look at Romans 4, it says that uh, it talks about circumcision as the sign and seal of, uh, of the righteousness that Abraham had by faith before he was, uh, before he was uh, circumcised. So in that sense, circumcision is a sign and seal, just like uh, baptism is a sign and seal. But of course, then Abraham is told to go and circumcise his eight-day-old son and so on. So it's a sign and seal of faith, but an eight-year-old, eight-day-old child, how, how, how could they have, have faith at that point, right? 
So the fact that it's a sign and seal of faith doesn't exclude it from being given to children by analogy um, to, to, to circumcision. Okay, hope that answers the questions uh, online. If you want to chat to me in person, also you can. Uh, so let's, uh, let's conclude then. Uh, three points as we finish. Number one, we need to remember here we're not uh, on the whole discussing gospel issues, but church issues. I mean, if we're talking about transubstantiation and things like that, then maybe, yes, it's elevated to be a gospel issue. You say, unless you are baptized, you can't be saved. Okay, it's become a gospel issue uh, uh, there. But whether or not you accept pedo baptism or not, pedo communion or not, that's, that's not a gospel issue. It's a church order level issue. And so it's possible to agree to disagree. We're still in fellowship with one another. Right? So charity is, re is required to recognize that uh, uh, on many issues where we uh, might disagree, we're both trying to argue from the scriptures. We're both trying to understand what, uh, what uh, the Bible is saying. So because you come on one view and, and not another, it doesn't mean that you're not uh, upholding the authority of scripture. It doesn't mean that you're not a faithful Christian. That, that would be wrong. Right? Uh, it's similar to the weak and the strong in Romans 15. The weak and the strong assumes that there's a right answer and a wrong answer. But the strong person is not to have judgment on the weak person. Uh, so whatever our personal views are uh, on these things, and we need to keep working them out, in the end it's also important for the church to have an agreed policy on it for the sake of, uh, of clarity for everyone involved. What should they do or not do for unity? So we've already got the one on baptism. We've looked at that, and uh, I think we will need to work on the, the Lord's Supper one too, just to make that uh, clear for everyone. So... Thank you.